Hey, everybody, this is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. Man, we've got a West Coast legend with us. Uh, with Darren Ney, a couple of quick announcements. I want to first thank Greg Loyacano for connecting us. Greg, right on. Uh, second, make sure you go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash subscribe, and you can subscribe to the show in both the audio and video formats. And uh, Carlos Santana, Joe Walsh, love to have you guys on my show. If someone can, listening can connect us, please do. Let me tell you about Darren. He's a real badass. Great musician, really great songwriter. Uh, grew up in the Bay Area, started playing around eight years old, grew up with Nicky Bloom, and they started as a duo together in their 20s. They formed a band called Nicky Bloom and the Gramblers, where Darren was playing lead guitar. Toured California, slugging it out until they had a viral video that made them a national touring act virtually overnight. We're going to ask him how everybody could do that. <laughs> but he won't have an answer, unfortunately. Um, they got to do lots of really cool stuff in the following years based on their reputation as a live act. They played at Bonnaroo. They played the main stage at the Newport Folk Festival. Appearances on late night TV like Conan. The band is on an indefinite hiatus right now as Nikki is pursuing a solo career. But the Gramblers themselves are still writing and making music together that people will hear this year. The band toured so much that uh, Darren was also playing at Terrapin Crossroads with the Dead Scene, all those guys out there. He's a lifelong deadhead, so that place opening was like a dream for him. He was there the first night and still goes back as often as he can when he's home, and some of the best musical friendships he made were formed there. I've had a few guys from that camp on the show. Really cool, all of them. Um, in the last few years, Darren started spending more time in Nashville, actually. Co-wrote an album that got a lot of attention this year by a young lady named Carly Driftwood. He's been writing with other artists and learning production. Earlier this year, he released a single called West Coast Mama, including Tim LaFay, who's a bass player for Tedeschi Trucks, David Bowie and others, Peter Levin, who played keys for Greg Allman and The High Woman, Grambler's drummer Mike and Greg Loyacano. It's his first single as a solo artist. His next one is coming out next month. Actually, great song. Really, really cool video. It's got beautiful murals, hills of San Francisco, and a beautiful sunset and ocean on it. And he directed and put the video together himself. We'll talk about that. He's also animated four other music videos this year. Three for Greg Loyacan, who I just mentioned, who is on this show, by the way, if you want to check his episode out. And one for himself that was a lot of fun. His goal over the next few years is to focus more on filmmaking in general, especially in ways that can relate to music. And if any of you listening want to talk with Darren about making videos, I would encourage you to look at some of the stuff he's done and then go to his website, Darren Ney, D-E-R-E-N-N-E-Y.com and uh, hit him up on there. Right now, he's working on an album for this year. He's releasing singles monthly or bi-monthly as they come out. He also formed a charitable organization called Backline which is the music industry's health and resource hub. And it was founded in the wake of Neil Casal's suicide. And what they do is they, they actually help musicians. And if I'm messing this up, Darren, please correct me, coordinate their way through the system to figure out what resources are available to them. I'm assuming more specifically with mental illness and, and addiction and stuff like that. Is that correct? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. We'll talk about that as well. Man, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you coming on the show. Yeah, thank you. And I love your it's work, man. I, I, I listen to your single, um, and I've listened to a lot of the stuff of you online. You're a very good writer, man. Very melodic. Thank you. Thanks, yeah, man. man. I appreciate really that. really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, how'd you first get started in the music business, and like, what was maybe your first break? Um, well, you know, I, I, I sort of forced my myself into there you the go. music business um where i you know when i was a kid uh i grew up going to I don't know if you've ever heard of the gilman club out here um it's sort of a, a semi-famous Co country um, western no was it's it? a punk it's a punk rock okay. club but it's a it's a um it was a community run punk rock club with run by volunteers and it started in the late 80s um and uh, it's sort of a seminal place in the in the sort of punk scene back then because um, you could you, you, there was no drinks there was no you know shenanigans but you could go there and like you know mosh or whatever and you just know, no it, alcohol yeah but no alcohol and it was all ages so it was ten year olds moshing with you know four year olds 
and it was a really unique scene of just people who were um who wanted to keep punk music alive you know in in the 80s when it was sort of struggling and so um so i grew up going there where it was sort of this very it was like the Muppet show, you know, it was like, let's put on a show, you know, um, and, show. and it was just, you know, it was just like, let's get a group together. Let's get a stage. Let's get some speakers and we'll have a show. And so uh, that was kind of my mentality for a long time. So as soon as I started playing music and, and wanting to, to, you know, play, we were, you know, the idea of playing an actual club and doing shows and stuff seemed impossible. So we just rented out vets halls and um, just rented places around town and through our own shows. That's and we would really just ask cool. our friends to be security and, you know, um, invite all our, all our pals to come. And um, that was really, you know, when I think back on it, that it never really stopped from that point. It was always sort of just finding a way to, to create my own little music scene. Um, I, as opposed to everything else in life, I've sort of tried to think of how to get in the door. Yeah, yeah. And, and with music, it was just sort of like you don't need a door; you can just sort of make your own door, and um, and do it. And I think that Gilman had a lot to do with that because I just thought I didn't see that line between a venue and and you know uh, some crappy <laughs> warehouse. It seemed like you can just do a show; it's the same thing, you know. So. Let me ask, that's really interesting because a lot of musicians struggle with, um, for lack of a better word, marketing or pushing to get themselves out there. And you didn't have any hangups with that. What, how come? I want to talk to you about the Bose S1, which is an amazing speaker for acoustic guitars that I've been playing lately. The S1 has two separate channels. It has one for your guitar and then another one for a microphone. And then there's a third channel you can use for a looper or for backing tracks that you could access by Bluetooth or through a one eighth inch plug. And the S1s are also very easy to carry. It's got an easy to grab top handle and absolutely anyone can tote it around. And it's also rechargeable for up to 11 hours. The S1 was specifically designed to optimize the sound of your acoustic guitar on acoustic guitar gigs. The guitar and mic channels each have separate tone, volume, and reverb controls, and there's also a proprietary tone match switch, which restores and optimizes the natural sound of your acoustic guitar, which as you know, is typically the biggest problem with acoustic amps. Now I tested the S1 myself and the tone, volume, and reverb controls sound great and they're very responsive. You can position the S1 in four different ways. You can tilt it back so you broadcast out to an audience or you could put it horizontally, vertically, or on a stand. And the cool thing is the S1 has a Bose accelerometer so it automatically adjusts the EQ and optimizes the sound for whichever one of these four positions you're using. The S1 also happens to be the best Bluetooth speaker that Bose makes, which is pretty compelling since Bose is known for the quality of their Bluetooth speakers. So effectively, you have an acoustic guitar amp, a PA, and a killer Bluetooth speaker all in one. And the bottom line is this. If you're an acoustic guitar player, there's absolutely nothing out there that sounds this good and this big that's also easy to carry and battery powered. As far as the Bluetooth speaker goes, I've used it many times here at home for family barbecues and the sound is so good, my kids wind up arguing over who gets to play the music they want. You know, it's literally like having a full stereo system out on your patio. You can use the S1 for DJing, tailgating, or whatever you want. Before this, you'd have to spend a bunch of money on loads of different speakers and pedals to get the same thing the S1 does on on its own. On top of that, it looks great just like all Bose devices do. And besides whatever money back guarantee you get from wherever you buy the S1, Bose also warranties the S1 for two years for any kind of defects in materials or performance. For more information and to find out where to get your own S1, go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash S1. That's everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash S1. Get the S1. It's out standing. Are you looking to buy or sell a home in the Tampa Bay area without having to deal with pushy realtors? Then make sure you connect with West Florida Real Estate. West Florida Real Estate has helped over 300 homeowners and investors buy and sell their properties over the last five years. Their service is outstanding, just like back in the days when there was actually service in the service business, and you'll never have to deal with any kind of sales junk when you're working with them. 
For more information, email Ann with an E at WestFloridaRealEstate.com. That's A-N-N-E at WestFloridaRealEstate.com. If you're enjoying this show and you'd like to support it, go to EveryoneLovesGuitar.com forward slash support. And for information on advertising, visit EveryoneLovesGuitar.com forward slash advertise. I mean, congratulations for, you know, for Thank not. you. Well, I, I mean, true. I'm not just saying this. It was truly ignorance. I, I didn't, I mean. I, feel, I hear you. Yeah, I mean, I just didn't, it didn't occur to me. I mean, the, because like I said, I mean, you, I was going to see these shows. It was, you know, Green Day came out of there and rancid a lot of these these bands oh my, that, like big uh, bands were, big bands you know we were watching that happening going like well okay i mean how hard can how hard can it be so i could do this that's what you thought yeah exactly Good for you man. yeah i mean that's the thing of the the sort of punk diy thing that really stuck for me even as my tastes sort of changed over the years in music is that sense of that you just sort of make it happen you know you just you just figure out what you want to do and do it. Even if it's your janky little version, Yeah. at least it's not, you're not having to, um, you know, follow somebody else's rules or ideas. You're, you just, you just do it, do what you want your way. You know, uh, man, a guy told me many years ago, he said, things happen when you're in motion, not in meditation, you know, like it almost yeah. doesn't matter, but as long as you're doing something, something's going to happen, you know? Yeah. I love that. I love that. Truth to that. Yeah. I think there's a lot of truth in that. Where was this Gilman Club? You know, it's still going, which is amazing. Um, and uh, <laughs> but it's in Berkeley. That's wild. Um, and it's just kind of—it's a very random. It's like a community center. You know, it was just—it's uh, a really fascinating story. And you know, the amazing thing is there was another place called the Berkeley Square, also in Berkeley, contemporaneous with it. It actually was more '70s and, and closed in the early '90s. But it was the same thing, which was—but that was a straight-up bar just a dive bar right. club, but it was all ages. So you could, you could get in if you had a, you know, you'd put like a, an X on your, on your um, palm or whatever, <laughs> you know, wristbands, something like that. So it was definitely, you know, they were um, trying to keep you from, from drinking. It wasn't like that, but, but you could do it. I mean, they weren't, you know, there wasn't any, anyone stopping you. So my mom used to drop me off like, you know, a couple blocks away, so the big kids wouldn't wouldn't see me getting dropped off by my mommy. That's, and um, so your mom was pretty going, cool to do that. Obviously, she was very cool. Yeah, I think yeah. she sort of. I think she saw the tide um, <laughs> coming early. I think she realized I was probably on a different path, and so she started being pretty cool about embracing that some of that stuff. And so, you know, it was a two way street where I would go, but I really wouldn't drink. And I really wouldn't get into like shenanigans and stuff because she would also have to pick me up after. And, you know, I would. Oh, so you kind of like honored her wishes. Yeah. To, yeah, totally, that's pretty yeah. cool to you, man. Because it was really about the music. I mean, that's what I wanted to see. That's, yeah. that's why I really wanted to be there. And so it was almost like a book report. You know, she'd pick me up and be like, um, you know, how was it? Come here, um, sorry, it's my, my little, I have a little puppy who's full of energy. And oh, that's whatever. awesome, man. I love puppies. Yeah. I love animals. Um, but, um, so she would, um, you know, pick me up and say, you know, how was the rock and roll show? And in fact, you, Greg Lucano, who you mentioned, uh, my first experience with him was being 14 years old and standing there in front of him at uh, the Berkeley Square. Oh, my God. So you guys have known each other forever. Yeah. I mean, he was young. I mean, he was whatever, 22, 23. And um, yeah, I just I mean, you know, I didn't even know him. I just was a little, some some idiot kid in the crowd looking at him and being like wow this guy kicks ass you know that's wild man really cool yeah really yeah cool. it's crazy so but that place same thing it was just like it broke down that it was different than going to see something at, at a, an arena or you know something that seemed real intangible it seemed totally tangible as long as you had you know meager expectations and i think that that really did did influence me to to not really think about it and just go i'll just do a show that's what you do just right? do it you know? good for yeah. you man that's awesome i'm gonna look that place up because it sounds interesting the gilman club yeah l l m a n g i one l g i l m a thank you man yeah. i'm definitely gonna look yeah. that place up so you just released your first single west coast mama great record i was curious what prompted you to start a solo record and also have there been like any surprises in making the record like 
I don't know about you. I always find that the things that I thought would be easy were not, and things that I thought would be really difficult were easy. Anything, stuff like that? Yeah, um, that's funny you say that. Yeah, well, um, I had been working on a couple of other sort of long gestating projects. And one of the things about, you know, the recording side of music is its glacial pace is maddening. You know, is it just, it's not uncommon to, you know, make a record and not see it come out for a year and, you know, all, all that stuff. It's just, it drives you crazy. And, you know, you have a pause in something like I was working on a, on a project with some other really great musicians and suddenly one of them had to take a, you know, month break for a personal reason. And then that pushed everything else um, you know, suddenly everyone else's schedules got sort of haywire. And so I just found myself kind of frustrated with like, God, this, sh this should be so easy. Um, and it's not. And so I started I really, it's been my, was kind of my mantra of last year and is kind of carrying into this year, which is sort of, uh, to pull back, um, and get, get as simple as I can and figure out what I can do at a given time. Like rather than getting tripped up on what I, would love to do or what I, you know, dream would be, you know, better or whatever. I just sort of decided to do something that I could do. And I had written this song and um, I just liked it. And I wrote it in like August and I just thought, I'm going to put this out next month. And so just you said it. it. So w back up one second. What prompted you to have that, like, to suddenly like, I got to get shit done attitude? Well, it was that, you know, sort of, I was working on all this stuff for a long time. And it was waiting on kind of, you know, I mean, it wasn't anyone's fault, but it was just sort of waiting on other people and waiting for right. things to align. It just became so frustrating. So I thought, what can I do myself, you know? And so it could have just as easily been me grabbing somebody else to sing the song. It wasn't so much about like, I want to, you know, do a single for myself. Um, I just wanted to get something done. I wanted to get production, get something done. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because a lot of the work, I mean, I've been doing a lot of writing stuff, a lot of production stuff that's behind the scenes and it just occurred to me that like the, the you know the crowd that is still patient enough to be following me that like you know they haven't heard a recorded you know song in a while because it's right. just not been that hasn't been the part that I've been focusing on so I just really thought like man I just I got to get something out for for my own just um sanity yeah sure uh, so that was it you know and, and it was and it was like I'm gonna get this out next month and it took a little longer it ended up coming out in October but it came out about eight weeks after I wrote it. And That's that was like I, really quick. Yeah. And I was really interested in that. And I, you know, it's kind of what I did again for this second single, which was, you know, written a little earlier, but, you know, trying to just kind of get stuff out quick. Um, talk about the feeling after you get stuff out. You know, it's great. Yeah. It, the thing, the, the great thing about putting music out that I think people sometimes don't think about when you're, doing it is that um once it's out it's always working for you and it's you're always creating an opportunity for people to have a special experience with it and the part of the, the great thing about music you know people can be really um self-doubting and cynical I, I, most musicians i know are are you know <laughs> insecure Definitely. about that stuff and but the the thing is that music is so amazing that if you don't totally screw it up and sometimes even if you do um people so, someone's gonna like it yeah people do, i mean it's music and so yeah. you you know just by virtue of you playing a g chord you're a third of the way there you know i mean mm -hmm. it's just that's the best thing about it and so um so putting it out was great because it was just all positivity i mean that's what i thought was was great because you have so much so many negative things and there's so many you know the the money and the you know everything about the music business is sort of difficult but the one time it's really pure and beautiful and fun is a release day when you get something out and, you know, people get to hear it and get to, you know, say they like it or say, oh, I don't, this isn't as good as the old stuff or whatever. It's all great. You know, nobody, nobody that. really says that though. Do they come Does someone ever? There's actually, always somebody. Yeah. There's always you're somebody. kidding me. No, I mean, I think it happens, you know, to everybody, but there's just always somebody who says it's cool. Like, you know, Maybe not not as rocking as I would have expected from. Oh my! Or, you know, like, yeah, you know what? That's. Uh, always, but I love that too. I mean, you know, that's because it's good to know. I mean, you know, I don't. I, I maybe I'm not gonna. It might not affect how I do things, but. Yeah. Um, yeah I, I, hope I not. still like. <laughs> but I still like to. 
to know. I get it. You want to, it's good to hear everything, but it's always like, I don't know, man. I always, and maybe it's because, not maybe, but it's probably because I'm doing this show. I realize how difficult it is to do, to put out a piece of music, you know? Yeah. Um, so to sit and, and when I see people criti- you know, you can always criticize anything and, and, and rest assured someone out there will. You know, no matter yeah. what it is, whether it's a, a piece of your music, my show, whatever. Um, but it's yeah. so hard to do what you guys do, man, just to put out anything. I would I would just say, hey, man, great. You know, and if you don't <laughs> like what <laughs> like what's yeah. served by saying, you know, I know. Well, you know, it's funny. I was I showed uh, my my um, new single to a friend of mine and I had shown her two um, two versions of this guitar solo. And we both kind of didn't like one of them and sort of knew one of them quote just was, it was, it was going for something that, you know, it just didn't, wasn't quite landing. Right. And the, and the other one seemed to me like, a, you know, like the right thing. And, um, I showed it to her and she went, well, how married to this solo are you? And I was like, I mean, I guess I'm not, I'm not totally married. Why? What did you, what did you think? And she just said, um, well, I kind of, I was thinking, you know, maybe this, and she sort of had, had like a description of what she wanted. And I, and I told her that the, the joke usually when people do that is that, you know, people in, in the studio, sometimes you have friends stop by or you show things and they go, I was thinking maybe more like this is that you hand the guitar over and go, well, great. You know, I would love to, <laughs> I'd love to hear it. Why don't you show me just what, what you had in mind? <laughs> because it's, you know, it's so easy to say, yeah. well, you know, why don't you do this or that? Um, I, I can't tell you how many times I've had people say, you know, I hear like a little kind of Derek Trucks thing on, on that song. I think that'd be kind of cool. And I'm like, yeah, it, that'd be great. <laughs> but do you know Derek? I mean, I would, I would love to do that. Or could you get me lessons or something? I'm yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> We'd all like to have Derek Trucks playing uh, on our song. Yeah, right, um, man. You know, uh, <laughs> but so, you know, you have to keep that in mind that, you know, people, they have their own, you know, ideas of things and everybody hears things differently. And, you know, you just have to do your thing. But I also don't take offense to it because I'm I'm that guy sitting there going, the song's cool, but it'd be a lot cooler with Derek Trucks on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's, you know, that's all part of it. I think it's just cool if people give it a chance. I mean, these days it's so yeah. hard to get people to even know you exist that to have someone even critique it means they, you know, listen to it. And that's that's a good thing. Talk about, you've done a really good job. And I think other musicians need to hear this. You've done a pretty good job about... Um, you know, squeezing blood out, you know, or squeezing water out of the limited, you know, uh, water, you know, like, let's say uh, in the old days, you put out a record and, you know, it would be like a big soppy wet towel so, with money in there. So you wanted it, you just had to tap it a little bit. Now it's like, you got to squeeze the wash to get a few drops. But I think you've done a, a, a few things that are really smart. And if you're cool talking about it, I think other people should do some of these similar things as well. Yeah, well, I sort of, um, you know, my, with, with Dickie Bloom and the Gramblers, we did everything, uh, you know, especially, you know, in an escalating sense. We did everything sort of by the book and very much like this is the way that it's done. This is how the music industry goes. This is what you spend money on. And you, know, you find yourself spending 10 grand making a record and, you know, five grand trying to get people to, to buy it and, you know, three grand printing it. And, you know, I mean, doing all these things because it's, it's, you know, what you're supposed to do. Sure. And, you know, if you're a band that can get away with it, if you can make the numbers work, um, that's, that's one thing. But for me, you know, doing something like what I've been doing, I decided to start from the backwards. I mean, it's really kind of the DIY punk thing again, honestly. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny that I, you didn't really think about it that way, but it's, you know, it's really the same thing. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Which is just kind of like, what do I have, you know? And so in my case, I was really lucky because some of the things that I had were um, uh, the drummer from the Gramblers, Mike Curry, is sort of uh, um, all around just hitman who can do kind of anything. He plays guitar, he writes songs, he sings, and he, he plays amazing drums and is very diverse as a drummer. And um, we have similar energies about making music, which is very much like little boys. We just have fun. We love it. We would just play rock guitar 15 hours a day if, if we were allowed to. And, you know, that was all we would If we were allowed to. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? If, if it, all it was was just sitting around playing, you know, 
Metallica yeah. songs in a garage, I'd be happy for the rest of my life, you know? And he's yeah. the same way. We're kind of old school, you know, rockers like that. And so um, he was just down to really help me do this. And the drums are the, are sort of the most difficult thing of recording. And so that we sort of decided from the beginning, like, let's just record this all ourselves and see how that goes. And we did that. And that attitude carried over into putting out the song and the merchandise and all that stuff. It was all kind of like, how can I make something out of what I don't have? So by putting out one single, you know, usually you'd put out an album and, and a, you'd, you know, you choose a single from it and you, you know, have band merch and you, you know, maybe a year later you'd have a shirt sort of based on a single and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I sort of decided to step back and look at the, the crowd that's already with me that has, you know, stuck, stuck through everything and wants to hear things. And I just thought more specifically, like, um, you know, what would, what would Mandy like, you know, what would that, what would this person who, you know, follows me dig? And I thought like, well, a cool shirt, um, you know, that was not too promotional, you know, like I have a couple shirts that don't like say my name on them and stuff, you know, or something or about the song. And I just tried to think of the fans first, think of my resources, which were few and just pile those all together to do something to kind of to, to pull the most out of it. So even with the merchandise, you know, they're really small run merch that I make less money on. Um, but at the same time, there's a little bit more um, flexibility in, um, you know, uh, having different designs and, you know, seeing what things work. And, you know, I, I don't have 500 shirts sitting around in a warehouse going on bot that I go, God, I spent, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. Have you ever done point thought about doing point of sale? Uh, yeah, I've looked at it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's yeah a lot. Right. I mean, you don't have to take it. You, you make the, you know, the downside is you, t you make a few bucks less per shirt, but the upside is you could put out 20 designs. It doesn't matter if none of them work. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, I did something sort of, I mean, it's similar to that. And I think I'm going to be doing more of that um, in the future, but that kind of print on demand um stuff can be is really intriguing because yeah you can do so many different types of styles and offer so many different things and you know your crowd is it's just really important to respect that um that relationship that you have and i've you know i've been in in bands and in situations that were not respectful of that and um it you just watch it dissipate people people know you know people people are smart the public mm. um gets it and uh you have the second you start thinking separately i remember mel brooks said a long time ago that uh he he knew he had kind of lost his way as a as a humorist um when he he did a movie and he found himself writing jokes and saying oh they're gonna love that instead of i love that you know okay yeah and i think that that's i i always think about that of the second you think you're smarter than the audience or, you know, like I, I get what's going to make them laugh instead of what's going to make me laugh and what's going to make me happy. Um, then they're, they're ahead of you, you know? Yeah. And so, um, so you're talking about being authentic in what you're doing. Yeah. yeah. And I think it goes even to stuff like merch. I just think people can tell when, oh, yeah. when you put up some, you know, crappy shirt or when you put up something that people kind of go, Oh, this is, you know, I mean, how often do you see that of, you know, you don't like your, your favorite bands, you know, tour shirt, yeah, or whatever, and um, so I, I I like that idea of keeping more options open, and you know, if people, I had somebody write to me and say, I would really love to get that shirt in um, another color. You know, is that possible? And it was possible to um, set it up that way. So I just did oh, cool. that for one person, <laughs> you know, but I added it to the store, so right. anyone so else now, could do it. Yeah, yeah. So are you going to release a separate shirt for each single now? I think so. I mean, I think again to the same thing of like, I'm, there's going to be one for the next, for, for this next single crown shyness because the, the parentheses on the song is stay home and get high. <laughs> it's a, it's well, a, that, that's what the title of your, like what young woman, especially that's a fan of music and especially that's a fan of your music doesn't want to wear a shirt. This is West coast mama. Yeah, I know, right. Well, that's pretty, and I know you didn't like come up with the title, like, oh, what t shirt's going to sell? But I mean, it just so happens that's, yeah, that's a pretty compelling shirt to wear if it looks good, you know? 
Yeah, well, that was that's the thing, and you know, and then this next one, like the title of it, like I said, is Crown Shyness, Stay Home and Get High, which is a weird title, but yeah. I made a T-shirt that says Stay Home, Get High, and it's the same thing. And with West Coast Mama, it was the same thing of, uh, you know, I just wrote the song, and I I certainly wasn't thinking of it as being, you know, uh, I mean, it has a it has explicit lyrics in it. Yeah, yeah. and uh, you know, it wasn't I wasn't thinking too much of it, but then I thought, huh, there's a cool thing you know, to be, to be made here of that same thing of, I thought I could see a, a t-shirt with that on it. And, um, so yeah, it was like just a, another, um, gamble to see if anyone would dig it. And then people loved them. They really yeah. loved the shirts. It was a big response to the shirts. And, you know, I made more off of those shirts than I did off of the song, which makes, you know, virtually no money. So, um, you know, that's another, <laughs> nice thing is you just open up that that avenue. another income stream yeah man yeah and, and that's why i wanted you to talk about this because i think that's a great idea like for a lot because you're not the only person just releasing singles you know periodically or yeah. or or a lot of people are now making an ep but man if you're going to survive in music today i think it's really important that you at least consider other avenues of making money and having a t-shirt for each song is pretty cool because then the thing is there's a lot of people that buy just because they're collectors so yeah you may have six songs on your ep and you're going to have the collector people buy every one of those because they want to have the whole collection yeah exactly it's fun i mean you yeah. know that's why again the, the thing of you know thinking of your own mentality of you know i remember um with uh you know growing up and being a fan of the grateful dead that you know they would have these newsletters they'd send out and like, you know, in hindsight, they're just sending out these newsletters being like, here's our new merch. But as an, as an audience member, I always felt like they were really, um, they cared about, you know, what, what uh, we were being sold, that they weren't just selling us sort of any, any old crap, you know? And so when they would offer something to be sold, I sort of took it a little more seriously because I respected right. the, the relationship that they had with the audience. And I thought like, you know, instead of just, oh God, these guys have, some dumb t-shirt it was like I, I just trusted that this was a genuine thing of like well we tried to make a cool shirt because we know you guys like cool shirts right and so i try to really keep that mentality of, of um you know just making sure that you're doing something that you would think is is cool yeah. and fun and you know my favorite bands i'd love if you know when they had a great song that i dug and i would love to just kind of like get a random t-shirt you know, yeah yeah i think yeah. it's a great idea and I, and I think a lot of people should can and should take you up take up that same uh, position on it man you yeah. have to make yeah. and and you never know where that can lead you you know you might lead to holy shit we have a nice little new merch business here that we never even thought we had yeah right right you know? totally yeah exactly talk about you've made a several music videos at this point and thanks for sharing that i think that was really helpful yeah uh you've made several music videos at this point they're all really cool and they're very engaging, which is the most important part of making a video or any kind of entertainment, you know, it's got to be engaging. How did you get into video uh, making? Um, I mean, honestly, you know, not to be repetitive, but same thing of like, it was like, man, I mean, it costs so much money. We spent, we did a video, the Gramblers did a, a music video um, that costs a lot of money. And um, we had um, some amazing actors in it and we built this giant set. It was this whole thing. And for various reasons, it just didn't come together quite, you know, in, in the ways that we wanted. And, you but know, but the money was I, sunk. But the money was sunk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, I mean, it, it's cool. It ended up good, but it just wasn't, wasn't quite what we had in mind. And so um, I think uh, that was a real lesson to me of just kind of like, it doesn't matter what you use, you know, what, how much you spend and all that stuff, but you should make something that's, that's cool. Um, and you know, these days you kind of have to have some video content like that. So I had been sort of working on this kind of thing for a while when Greg reached out to me and said, you know, I had done a, I had done a video for the mother hips, um, a couple years earlier, a lyric video, a really simple one. And that was how he thought of it. Um, but I really wasn't prepared to do a video like his when he, when we talked, but his song was so evocative and I could just see it. I could see those um, Saul Bass opening titles from, you know, like sixties movies. And I just thought like, Oh, that's it. You know? And so once I had it in my head, I just thought, I'm just going to figure out how to do this. And so um, it was definitely just sort of learning on the fly and 
um, you know, it took, a, it took a while because we were, we were just sort of, you know, it was just, just to be creative and see what would happen. And each step of the way has kind of been like that. I mean, I'm obviously into film and, um, you know, have done a lot of sort of little stuff over the years, but, um, but, uh, what do you edit that was on? definitely Adobe? just out of this. Huh? Sorry. Go ahead. You, do you use Adobe Premiere? Like what program do you use? Yeah. 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 To, to cut it, I use Adobe Premiere and a lot of the, they've had a lot of effects and stuff. So yeah. like for the, for San Felipe, which is the animated one, I used, uh, after effects, uh, Adobe after effects, which is basically That's like a 3d sort of motion Photoshop basically. Um, and so, um, that was, uh, but that came out of, you know, basically just like necessity and, um, then um uh the next video was sort of the same same thing of just he had a different sort of vision and um each one has just sort of been like let's just sort of solve the problem in front of us and and see what we can do and in doing so we've, we've done three really different um videos and then i kind of used some of those tricks that i learned for that on uh on my video and on this and this upcoming one um crown shyness has a has a uh an animated video. It's my first sort of full on, it's like a cartoon for the full, you know, four minutes of the song. Um, and it took a long time. I basically started working on it around when I started doing Greg's video, uh, you know, almost a year ago oh, before wow. I really knew what it was, where it was going to end up. It sort of started as tests of an idea that I had and then kind of grew into, you know, being this, this music video. Um, so it's been real kind of on the fly and very much just, you know, about, you know, trying to be creative and, and, um, you know, do stuff cheap and, and hopefully make it, um, be, uh, engaging. How did you learn premiere? Did you like get, get Linda L Y N D A or did you just like go on YouTube or how? Did... No, I went on YouTube. Yeah. I, I always say that like, um, I got taught by, by like 12 year olds in, right. you know, dude, I, like... I, I, I feel you on that, man. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing, you know, you just, you know, basically the, the trick is sort of coming up with uh, the question. I think the hardest thing is knowing what to yes, ask. Yes, knowing the right for. Right. Right. So I would just start by like, you know, a lot of times on message boards, but I would just sort of Google like, how do you do, you know, uh, cut paper type animation or whatever? And you would just find some little thread with some example and some whatever and maybe find a link. And it just was was sort of one foot in front of the other. And you know, for a long time, and, in, and still in many, you know, areas of my life, I'm not very disciplined, not very good about seeing the kind of like, okay, do this now, and it'll pay off in a year kind of thing. <laughs> um, and uh, this was one of the few things that because I was just so interested in it, um, I just started digging in and, and stepping forward, having no idea if it would just if I would just find out you can't do this at all, like you're, you're out of your mind. Yeah. Um, and that so it was a surprise to me to, to find that all these things were kind of doable. And I would say to anyone listening, especially if you're thinking, you know, that you have an idea or, you know, you, there's something that you wish you could see as being your video, but you don't think you can do it. Um, you can do it. You just have to kind of break it down and figure out, you know, how to, how to achieve it. But these days the technology and everything has evened out so much that it's really just a matter of, you know, will at this point. Well, I think is what you said is true uh, for anything like, you, you know, having discipline to do something is directly related to how interested you are in it. I mean, that's why a lot of people, they sign up for the gym, they never go because they're not really interested, you know, yeah. um, yep. or anything like that. Or they sign up to play guitar and they don't do it. You know, you have to be committed because discipline and commitment, man, they go hand in it. I mean, it's a lot easier to be disciplined when you're committed, you know? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's no, so true. What's the name of Greg's last single? Because I want to at least tell people to listen to that. It was gorgeous with the giraffe, man. You did such oh, yeah. a good job on that, man. Yeah, thank you. Um, that was, um, that's called uh, Chamberlain's Trunk. Right, Chamberlain's Trunk. So uh, what I want, what I would love you guys listening to do is check out Greg Loyacano's video. It's called Chamberlain's Trunk. And Dar uh, Darren made the video. Man, that, I just thought that, the the moving the giraffe makes the whole th it's like a thread you know and you got to see it through the end it was so clever and so engaging yeah. 
Thank you. Even if you don't like the music, which would be pretty impossible because it's a really good song. But yeah, it's a beautiful song. You, you want to hear? You want to see what happens to the damn giraffe, man? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. We all kind of fell in love with that giraffe. Yeah, but um, that was so smart on your part because you figured out. Let me get something that like people can immediately have a vested interest in because, like, it's not something you normally see. Uh, yeah. It's an animal. Most people love animals. It's a giraffe walking through different places. Giraffes don't go, you know, it, yeah. it was really yeah. smart, man. Thank you. Well, you know, it's funny. Uh, again, you know, just to illustrate to people how it comes out of necessity was that Greg wrote to me and he showed me the song. He said, what do you think of this? And I said, I don't know. I just, I closed my eyes and I kind of, I kind of pictured something kind of like the red balloon. Remember the yeah. red balloon? Yeah, sure. And I was like, and I was like, I kind of picture something like the red red balloon, or you know, like sort of one of those like those just real visual, simple the red balloon, but, but cool. kind of haunting and, and, and you know, uh, sort of compelling visuals. And so at first, the idea was this sort of floating guitar that was sort of like a balloon, and it's still an image I have. For, I, I may do sometime because it's, it's so it burned in my head. And there's the line in that song where he says like. You know something about you, you. You left your guitar in Chamberlain's trunk. Chamberlain's trunk. And so I like, and you know, the songs about addiction and you know depression and mm -hmm. you know all this stuff. And so I like the idea of sort of freeing that guitar. You know, because that line is is very sad if you think of this guitar sort of left in a trunk and still there. And so I, I like the idea of making this sort of guitar be emancipated. You know. Yeah. And as we were working on it, you know, and discussing it. Um, our friend uh, Neil Casal um, died, and it, the day that I was working on this video, I wrote to Greg and I said, "God, the guitar part on this is great. Like this is this is killer. People are gonna love this." And he said, "Have you heard anything today? Uh, any kind of weird, you know, bad news or anything?" And I said, "No." And he said, well, "I don't. I hate to tell you this, but that guitar part is played by Neil Casal, and I." I I've just had to confirm that he's dead. And um, we were very shocked and very sad. And we talked about it for a long time. And obviously it colored the song because I didn't even realize he was, he was playing on the song. Mm. And um, so it was, it shifted the, my perception of it a little bit. And for him, I think too. And, you know, we weren't, we weren't trying to make it too, you know, related to that or anything. But yeah. It definitely shifted it, our. It definitely, our, would how could it not cloud yeah, your I mean, our, vision? Our mood, yeah, the the mood of it seemed like different, more somber, and, uh, more somber. And yeah. he, he had this idea of he was sort of he had some vision of a giraffe, and he looked it up to see kind of what that meant. And the giraffe is a symbol of self acceptance and of sort of um, you know uh, reaching a destination and a kind of you know. Uh, accepting your own awkwardness and your own sort of weird place in the world and all that stuff. Where did he and look so, that up? So, sorry to interrupt you, but where did he look that up? Because I get thoughts like that sometimes, and I need a place to look shit up. <laughs> I, know, I don't know. <laughs> what did he just I, like enter to Google? What a giraffe symbolize, maybe? Or I think so. I mean, I think. Okay. I mean, I think it's different things, but I think you can just sort of look up, like you know, what do symbol, what do giraffes and dreams symbolize? And, okay. Yeah, yeah. And stuff like that, or what do they traditionally symbolize? I think. I, Greg seemed to really, you know, have it have it dialed in. I mean, he he definitely had a a real take on it. So I'm not quite sure where he got it, um, but he was. Um, but he 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 became sort of interested in that idea, and he wrote me and said, you know, what do you think about um, about this this giraffe thing? And and he described it. And the funny thing is, it was a misunderstanding because I thought he was talking about just for the album cover. And I thought he meant for the video, and I was like, "Wow, okay." So I'm like, "What a so maybe, what a happy mistake, man!" I know it was crazy. So I was like, "Well, okay, Holy so it was the giraffe instead of the instead Red of balloon. the guitar." Okay, and so I started thinking about that. I'm like, "Okay, could you have a giraffe? I mean, you can't have a giraffe floating around. Like, it would probably look too insane." So I thought, like, but like maybe a giraffe just sort of making his way. You know, we we talked more about where we thought he was going and all that stuff. But you know, later on. But I basically made a couple test clips, you know, I tried to figure out if it was an effect that could be achieved somehow. And I found a sort of way to do it and um, sent it to him and sent him kind of like a little 20 second clip. And he was like, 
holy shit, man. I, I love this. And he's like, that yeah. wasn't what I had in mind at all, but I love it. Um, so, so can you, could we do this for a whole video? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> so we'll see. Do and you? I just kept sort of plowing, plowing away at it. And, uh, and um, it, it ended up being really cool and taking on, you know, we sort of found the vision for it. But at first, it basically started as a, as a mistake. Dude, it's an amazing video. You, he, he needs to get some merch. With, <laughs> yeah, I know, right? With, with the giraffe, yeah. Or you guys need to split it or whatever, man. He, with yeah. Chamberlain's trunk with that giraffe because that was, it's impossible to watch that video and not just key in and enjoy that giraffe. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. He's lovable. He really is. <laughs> oh, it's just because it's just so like, you know, not normal to see like giraffes walking around, you know, metropolitan. Yeah, it, it's it's really evocative. I mean, by the time you see the giraffe in the by the coast and sort of, you know, walking out on the sea cliffs and stuff, you're so relieved. Yeah. Um, for him, uh, you know, uh, and but, but you're also kind of, you know, it looks a little perilous and um you know you have all these emotions about this you know this giraffe it's really amazing but but that's how good a video that's why you're making good videos man because how do you you know you created all those emotions they didn't just yeah come. you did that man so i mean that's yeah really hats off to you, you did a, a yeah wonderful, well thank you yeah thank really you. what's thank the next you. what's the next hot animal man we gotta figure this out <laughs> <laughs> i know right yeah it's gonna be a a lemur <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> an otter <laughs> Those are yeah 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 it's a little otter yeah um, no otters are little bastards actually are they really <laughs> yeah yeah they're funny they're little they're otters little, are little bastards that's your next t-shirt <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah <Otter> bastards. <laughs> <laughs> tell get, tell them I said it too. I don't care. Tell control, those honors I said they're bad. Oh, <laughs> oh man. Well, anyway, I'd love everybody to check out Chamberlain's Trunk. Darren directed and produced the video. It is just amazing. And uh, like I said, if anybody wants to have him help them and consult with them on video, you know, just go to his website, Darren Ney, D E R E N N E Y dot com. Uh, talk about Backline and your involvement in it. Oh yeah. Well, so backline, um, actually same thing that, you know, when Neil's death was a, was a really, um, monumental, uh, thing. It was, uh, there were, you know, there's a lot of suicide. There's a lot of sadness. I would, I think that, I think Jeff Austin from Yonder Mountain String Bands, uh, suicide early in the year had sort of started a conversation that Neil's death, uh, made people really want to act and say, okay, there is really something crazy here when some of our favorite musicians and some of the most, you know, successful musicians in their genre and stuff um, are, are feeling this disconnected and this sad. And, you know, I mean, suicide is a very complex issue, of course, but um, it seemed like there had to be something else done. And um, there were a lot of people talking about it in those, in those, days after he died and um i was just lucky that I, my my friend hillary gleason and another friend tori pitarelli who have done a lot of this type of work in other areas had been chewing over something like this and um i wrote a post that that, that day that um that i was talking about where we were working on the video i wrote a post uh about a conversation i'd had with with neil casal that kind of got picked up a lot and ended up being re reprinted in, in no depression. And it, it had like thousands of people sharing it. And so because of that, she reached out to me to kind of say, what do you think about this? You know, you obviously have thoughts on this as a, as a broad subject. So what do you think? And so um, I gave my thoughts on it and she said, I think, you know, we just need to act now because if even in a week, you know, you don't have, commitments you don't have whatever i'm gonna get people on board like right now and so i think within a week we were on a conference call with everybody from you know every organization that you can think of the grammy people the grateful dead people um music cares everybody um music cares does a lot of work i've had a lot of guys on the show that have been put through rehab from music cares as a matter of fact well and you know that was the the biggest thing to us is that when we started trying to figure out what the services were we realized how many great ones there were but that for one reason or another 
it was difficult to to navigate and um it oh, was oh, it's more, impossible it was, to navigate yeah and so that was sort of that became the the idea which was just how do we make this um easier and just uh you know, I, to me, the, the best thing about it as somebody who has been in, in a position to, you know, need things like this from time to time is that, you know, if I've, if I have needed help with something like this, I have, you know, people in my life that I can go to, I can go to my sister and say, Hey, I'm freaking out. I need some help. Um, yeah. you know, I need to see a doctor. I need to, you know, whatever. And, um, you know, I, I have people that I can sort of lean on that, that can untangle it for me and figure out how to help. And so many people don't, yeah. and especially musicians, you know, you're on the road and, you know, you're in the grind and you can't be weak for a day. You can't have a cold in a band without looking like, you know, you're being a wimp. So, sure. um, so that became sort of the, the, the idea was to get a caseworker, um, so that you, once you contacted backline and it's, and it's how it works now that, um, once you, oh, you, you have contact us, okay. yeah, basically it's a real human being that understands and that will help you navigate through um, the whole system. So, so, you know, my part in it is very small in that, you know, I just basically sort of said what I wished, you know, could happen. Um, and what they've done in implementing it has just been pretty mind blowing and they're doing great work. How did they get funding for these things? Uh, well, various things, but I mean, that's part of what we're all trying to do is kind of, you know, raise some money and, and raise some awareness, but they, I mean, I, I mean, I have no idea. I mean, it'd be, it'd be interesting to, they're not guitar players, but they'd be interesting to talk to them because uh, I don't know. I mean, it was really, like I said, I mean, it went from me having these conversations and kind of saying, Oh, well, this would be cool. Or that would be cool. And having absolutely no idea how to implement it um, to, you know, a couple weeks later, they're going, well, we have a hundred thousand dollars to start, you know, X, Y, Z. And that's awesome. You know, suddenly it was like, they were really, they just put the work in and, and got it done. If people want to contribute, was it backline.org? Would that what it be? Yeah, backline.org. Yeah, everybody yeah. check that out. If yeah, you or I'm sorry, no, backline.care. Backline.care. Yes, awesome. yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting, back to Neil, I had him on the show, and, and you and I talked about this initially, two weeks to the day he died, and I went back yeah. and listened to that. Because I wanted to make sure it was a pro you know it was appropriate to put out. Yeah, sure, sure. And I also wanted to say something in front of it, but didn't want to be like in the like any like sensational, you know what I'm saying at all. I just yeah, of course, to. yeah. And um, the part that was really upsetting is when we were talking about uh, needing help. And I said to him, how are you about asking for help? And he said, well, musically, he goes, I'd love to collaborate. I said, no, no, personally. He goes, oh, let's move on from that. And I was like, yeah. And, and you know, and, and listening to that afterwards, you know, it was just like fucking sad, you know, tragic, you know, because that yeah. is part of the biggest thing for anybody in any, whether it's addiction anything man just to get you know ask for fucking help and that's the toughest even from 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 god from whoever you just ask sure. for help you yeah know, whatever your thing is man yeah it's really hard and i think i think part of why neil in particular freaked everybody out is that i mean people were really shocked by jeff jeff austin i think that was really a a, a big thing um but i think with neil it was almost like that you know even being you know i was sort of a medium level you know friend of his and even i knew he was struggling um you know after chris robinson brotherhood had disbanded i had just heard you know that he's he's struggling and had had even had mutual friends sort of say like you know maybe it wouldn't hurt to reach out and say hey you know at particular times and i would just reach out and say hey and we would talk about you know metal records or you know something totally different yeah um but, you know, it was like, it seemed like whatever he was going through was handled, you know, like that it may be an ongoing struggle, but like, you know, he's around to, to have the, the struggle. Right. And I think when he actually, when he killed himself and in such a, um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a, I mean, it was a planned, you know, thing. 
right. um, you know, for a long time. And I think that uh, as that realization set in, that this was, you know, I mean, again, it's a complicated issue, but you know, that this was a, a conscious, you know, decision basically over a this long is, This was his time. solution to the problem. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. That it, and it, it was not a, it wasn't a rash moment that yeah. it was like, this was something he thought was the right way to go. And, um, you, that, you know, that's a sign of being so far down a certain kind of mental, you know, hole. Yeah. Um, no that I return. think really, yeah. And I think it, that really freaked people out of thinking, man, how did he get all the way from the Neil that we know who would, who would have been able to advise somebody else in that situation and given great advice and, and has a perspective to thinking that he's in this other place for him, for himself, which is, you know, common for, for people struggling with that. And so I think that that, um, that, uh, the fact that he seemed like the kind of guy that could be okay in these situations could kind of get through the rough stuff. Yeah. Um, but didn't, I think that was a big, like that, that really made people think about it in a, in a different way. And it's, it has seemed different ever since, you know, and, and, Musicians I know are kinder to each other. I mean, we all text each other more. We have a private group of all just touring musicians on Facebook. That's, that's great. Um, that's just for that of just sort of venting things and and sharing things with each other that where we can be vulnerable. And um, there's definitely a lot more of that of that attitude of of you know let's like let's stick around. Like all this other stuff is you know one thing, but we can't let any of this you know, get us down the way that, you know, it does for a lot of people. A couple of questions and then uh, we'll leave this behind. Um, One is, yeah, I'd love to get in touch with those people from backline because if I can help push that cause out, I'm really happy to support that. So maybe afterwards you can hook me up with them. Uh, The other thing is, um, is that a private group or can other, if if musicians that are touring or struggling hearing this, is there like a, a person they could reach out to to see if they can get into that group or... Um, well, I would say, um, just, if you just contact me on any social media Great. on okay. you know, Instagram or Twitter, or whatever, it's pretty, you know, that's the trick of it is that we really want to keep it private. Oh, I totally, um, yeah. right. I was figuring out how to ask. It. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I mean, but you're, but, but that's the other part of it is that we also really want everybody. And, right. And like, I want to make even this, if, yeah. even if you're, uh, I mean, it's also for road crew, for anybody who basically knows the feeling of having that thigh cramp in the van. Awesome. on you know leg four of a tour and you know has is has struggled through this um of any level you know if you're a touring musician um just reach out to me and i will invite you to that's or, really or, on, cool. or on facebook and, and whatever and thanks yeah I'll, I'll invite you in yeah thanks man i hope you don't mind i asked i just i, I, no, I know I'm a lot glad. of people I'm, listening to this no, could probably I'm, want that yeah yeah no especially this group yeah this is that's it's great thinking actually that so uh, any of you listening to our musicians definitely ask. Yeah. Uh, last three years, tax returns and uh, at least a picture of like 30 or 40 <laughs> backstage passes from recent <laughs> qualified. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's part of it. I mean, that came up though a lot with the backline thing, you know, no, you, you got to qualify. You know, there, were certain, too, yeah. there are certain things to qualify and we, we tried to keep that real loose in the sense of, you know, we just, I know musicians who, who work harder than anybody who, who have, you know, maybe two albums out that barely anyone's heard. Certainly they're, you know, haven't been Grammy nominated or, you know, there's all these yeah. sort of crazy stipulations. Um, and so we, we, a key thing people should know too with Backline is it's also for family members, for, um, for crew. It's not just for musicians, it's for everybody. So, you know, assuming you can just make a good faith argument about what you need. Um, that's all we really just require. ask for help, man. If you're struggling, just, yeah. ask for help, whether it's, yeah, you're addiction. not going to have to provide any forms. You're not going to have to yeah. do whatever. Cause a lot of these places do make you do that. And, um, we wanted to make sure that it was really simple. So it's a one step process of just, you, you ask for the help. And the next thing you'll have is a person, a caseworker that will help you get through it. Man, that's really good. I'm happy that you got involved, and I'm definitely down to support that any way I can. Yeah, thank put you. Put it out man. on thank the show. You. Yeah, that'd be my pleasure, man. Yeah. Everybody's been affected by addiction, and anybody who says they haven't is full of shit. I mean, you know. It's, yeah. It's not. It's a fucked yeah. up. Yeah. Not not pleasant thing. So. No, no. You grew up in the Bay, and thanks for sharing all that. Thank you, man. Yeah. Uh, you grew up in the Bay Area. What was your childhood like growing up? 
Uh, you know, it was great. I had a good childhood. I really did. I mean, I was a, I, ha- I was naturally a, I was a strange kid for sure. Um, I was, uh, <laughs> I, I was just, yeah. you like know, this, it's like you're describing somebody else. It's really funny. <laughs> yeah. He, he well, was a strange because lad. when I, because when I look at him, yeah, I mean, when I look at that little guy, I'm like, man, you were like, how did you make it? Um, <laughs> because I was just, I, I just had a really weird, my parents thought I was, was weird. And, uh, I, I, I had a very interior kind of, uh, you know, rich interior life that meant my exterior life was pretty bizarre. And so I was spending a lot of time dreaming and, you know, in sort of make believe land. And, um, I think, uh, uh, that, uh, you know, it, I was more isolated than I thought that I was, right. um, at the time. And, uh, you know, as I got older, some of those issues, you know, some of, some of the things of, being a kid sort of become a little bit more clear, but all the time that I was a kid, I was really happy. You know, I was, my parents were, were supportive and nice. You know, my dad would, you know, come to my, you know, baseball games that I, where I was the worst player on the team, <laughs> you know, but he would be, he's like, oh, it doesn't matter, man. When you're there. a dad, let me tell you. Yeah. You know, I went to all my kids shit, man. I knew, I didn't ever thought about what position they were at, man. Yeah. But it's yeah, a beautiful dad, thing. Yeah, you know I mean? Yeah. You know, you're on you're on teams with other kids who are you know some, sometimes the best players on the team. You know, they you see their dads once a year, or you know, maybe in the in the playoff game or something like yeah, that. Yeah. So, I was real lucky that I just my parents were supportive and and cool and and stuff. Even when they were, I think, a little mystified by my existence. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's always a part. You, you don't have kids, right? No, no. There, there's always a part. Like as a parent, you say, "Well, you know." Let's hope they grow out of it. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. You know, you see, just, because like, you know, your kids are who your kids are, and there's nothing you can do, and you have no right to change them, and you just, it teaches you to, you know, honestly, a lot of acceptance and unconditional love, but you just like, well, yes. I hope they grow out of it, <laughs> you know, whatever. I think that there was a lot of that, yeah. I mean, yeah. You know, my parents are pretty straight, straightforward. You know, I got, I was joked with my dad. He grew up with, uh, he would tell me the story growing up about his friend, Jimmy, who, who got into drugs and died young. And it was this whole sort of tragic tale. And when I was older, I realized he was talking about Jim Morrison. He'd grown up with with Jim Morrison. Oh my God. And I thought, and I was like, you know, of all the times you've told me the story, you never mentioned the, that part of it, but it was like to him, he was just going like, well, yeah, I mean, he got into music stuff and and all of that and stuff. But I mean, yeah. Well, because to him, it was sort of like, he didn't want to glorify it to him. It was like, the point is, drugs are, are not good but i was like once i found that out i'm like well as, i don't know it might have been worth it it's pretty cool he's jim morris <laughs> and um, hey, that, that's why he didn't tell you now earlier that's why he didn't tell me that because it wasn't yeah. my immediate thought was like well that's different i mean that sounds like cool you know yeah. so he was always um he they're just from a different world i mean even yeah. even my my grandmother i guess said about my dad the reason that she liked him for my mother was that my mother, you know, was of the age where she should have probably been with sort of a flower child. You know, she was, she, they were of that generation. Right. But my dad was just kind of one of those guys from like, from like a little earlier. He was like. Like steady job. Yeah. Yeah. yeah reliable, predictable. Guy. Wasn't interested in anarchy. No, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, so, and then, you know, here then they have a, a child that is pure anarchy. <laughs> And I, I think that it was, you know, weird for them, but they adjusted. Yeah. And like you said about unconditional love, I mean, I think that, you know, despite sometimes their great consternation, they, they were, they saw me for who I was and yeah. accepted it and um, were supportive from that point on. That's cool. Are your folks still around? Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, that's yeah. Awesome. Still around. Yeah. I just had dinner with them the other night. And oh, they're still together um, too. Yeah. They're still oh, that's together. Awesome. Very, that's a rarity. It's very rare, I know, and we're still in the same house that uh, that uh, I, I grew up in, and um, That's very cool. Yeah, man. yeah, it's yeah, it's really lucky. It really is. Yeah, good for you, man. Yeah. Good for them as well. Yeah. Tell me uh, some of the low points or dark periods you've had to deal with, and how'd you get through them? Um, well, you know, I had a when I was in college, I had a a friend of mine um, who was sort of the first kid. I went to this new school and this, this kid kind of had um, taken me in. He saw that I had no one to hang out with at lunch. And um, he kind of invited me over to this sort of club of, they were older guys and 
Um, they were music lovers and they were, they were the first guys to sort of talk about like Elvis Costello in glowing terms. And, you know, they were sort of those guys who, you know, explaining the connection between Nick Lowe and Elvis Costello. And <laughs> they were, they were sort of deep into these things were different than what I had been used to. And, um, this kid, uh, Dave, um, he had, he went to school at Santa Cruz and, um, uh, I, I had a friend, a mutual friend say, you know, Dave bought a, Dave bought a gun and he's freaking everybody out because he's, he's sort of joking about killing himself. And uh, so I called him and said, what's this about? You know, of course we're, you know, I'm, you know, a kid, I'm 18, 19 years old. So I don't really know how to handle this, but I'm like, uh, Hey, don't, you know, don't freak everybody out. What's with the gun thing. And he's like, Oh no, 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 it's nothing. I, he's like, you know, it's, it's like I bought a gun. I thought it'd be funny. And you know, I went to a went to a gun store and bought a gun. Like you know, it's it's, it's nothing. It was like, well, you're freaking everybody out. Is I I I believed him. I got off the phone. I thought everything was fine. And um, like a, a week later, um, coincidentally, on the day that uh, I broke up with my my high school girlfriend, um, and I was already very sad. Uh, I found out that um, that Dave had killed himself. And a few days later. Uh, I got a tape from him um, in the mail. Holy and, shit. Yeah. And it was sort of this jokey kind of thing of kind of like, well, you know, I did it. Um, if you're getting this, I did it. And uh, here's these songs. And now that I'm dead, it should be easy to kind of make these, uh, you know, a, a big hit. And, you know, it was this very sort of dark, you know, we shared a very you know dark sense of humor, but this was this. I always think about this when you think of people who are, suicidal how much they're not connecting to reality because he was still writing this thing as if like isn't this funny and crazy that you know Man, he, wow yeah so it was really it was a, a ton to wow. process obviously That's, i'm having a hard time processing holy shit i can't imagine was, as an 18 year old kid what you're going through it was Fuck. wild and he and the way he he did it was very public and it was right kind of in the middle of the school and it was really a it was a shocking story and um, so that was a real, that was the first time that, that I would say that uh, a lot of other, you know, things came to, came to the surface. You know, a lot of times you experience something traumatic. You start to kind of process a lot of other things in your life. And so that was a big moment in the sense of I started going to therapy. I started feeling, you know, really depressed myself. And I started getting in touch with a lot of my feelings. And um, that was a very dark period, but it's also one I feel very, um, you know, I look back on now and I feel like a lot of the growth that I did as a person um, yeah. came out of, out of dealing with that experience. Um, and so I think of that a lot of, you know, that as, as tough as it is, um, when bad things happen that, uh, it's just so important that you, you learn from it because that's something that could totally just be the gash across that time in my life. Yeah. That instead it has, you know, it, which it is, but instead it, it also has, you know, things that you could take from it that are positive. Holy um, shit. It, kudos to your parents for supporting you to go to therapy. Cause you know, a lot of people like everybody needs to go to therapy, man. Yeah, at some yeah, point, totally. or should, or should. Totally. Um, yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And it's funny. I was talking to a buddy of mine over the weekend. And he's got this this particular thing, and I was like, "Man, just go to a therapist. It's, you you just go figure out a couple. You know, you don't need like a few sessions to figure out what what about this particular issue hooks you." And he goes, "No, yeah. I'm never going. I would never go." I'm like, "Okay, you know, I'm not gonna. You know, yeah. you can't." beat someone, you know, I, you know, I'm not going to convince someone. All I could tell them is that it was helpful to me. Yeah. Um, but it's good that your parents sent you there at a young age because yeah. Yeah. They were, they were, um, you know, and, and growing up in the Bay area was, to, you know, people were, that's a very touchy feely, um, you know, place where people are, are concerned about your feelings and yeah. Yeah. Stuff. So it was lucky because yeah. The, and there was great help around and, um, you know, I had no idea how, how beneficial that was until, like you said, you know, getting older and meeting other people and seeing how attitudes about it are, are bad and availability is bad. And 
because yeah. I don't know how I would have gotten through those things if I hadn't been able to to really be honest and and ask questions and and you know connect uh, the feelings that I was going through to other things in my own life and just trying to understand depression um, you know I, I had never thought about it before and all of a sudden it's just at my doorstep yeah. where it's not just my buddies what he did but I'm I'm understanding how much that, that I have depression that's kind of unlocked this feeling of like this is a lot of what I've been you know I, I like a lot of what he felt are actually feelings I totally understand and sure sure and you don't want just, to be in the same situation of having no yeah. coping skills and then the, your, the end result the solution for you is you know yeah the same thing. yeah man I totally yeah agree. so that was a big sort of wake-up call yeah good for you for going um you know it's always like I'm not a guy who's gotten sober but I have a lot of friends who've gotten sober I know family members have gotten sober so I'm, and I'm really supportive of any kind of 12-step program but man I'll be honest with you that's the shit they should be teaching in education coping oh skills. totally you know, yeah, how totally. do you process your feelings when this happens? How do you react? How do you speak to somebody? How do you yeah. handle stress? You know, yeah. that, like my younger son, he's 27, almost 28. He uh, went back to college lab two years ago. And he's telling me he's got to take like fucking calc, I mean, calculus. And I'm like, God, why don't they, I, I cannot believe, you're not going to use that in your, I mean, he's going to be a physical therapist. It's not and remotely relevant, why wouldn't they be teaching, especially in college? Because, man, this is your last shot to reach people. Yeah, yeah. Why wouldn't they make them take coping skills? I just... I'm with you. We, you know, it's funny you say that because actually I think one of the reasons that I, that I thought to go to therapy was that when I was in high school, we had a class called uh, Peer Support. Peer and, Support, yeah. Yeah, and it was basically um, some some teachers from a from a local school who were who were I mean some some students from a, from a local school who were studying to become teachers would um, teach this class at our school where basically we just all sat in a circle and we would meet for a period and talk with each other and try to get through you know stressful situations it was basically group therapy but with maybe that's awesome 15 or 20 kids yeah and it was sort of like an experimental program I'm not sure that they kept it or I'm not sure how it how it went, but it, it was, it had a, it had a big impact on me. That's um, good. and they had, it was funny actually when I, when, uh, I got called in by my, um, by my guidance counselor and she described this class and said, there's this class, it's, it's going to be, you know, once a week or whatever it was. And you know, it's going to be, you're gonna have to leave your auto shop class, which means you're going to have to, you know, do extra work to make up for the days you're missing and all that stuff. And I went, oh, okay, well, I don't know that I, I'm not sure I'm one of these kids, that, you know, when she was describing, a, you know, for stressed out kids that really need to talk and whatever. And I said, I don't know if I'm, if I'm one of those kids. And um, she said, well, I don't know if you are either, but she said, what I know is that you could probably stand to be around more of those kids more often because yeah. you, you stress less than anyone I've ever met in my life and I think you need to stress a little bit more <laughs> you know, hey, good for her for being so open and honest with you man yeah cool. yeah and then the irony is what she didn't know is that a lot of my sort of you know relaxed nature was kind of was actually kind of covering up a, a lot of kind of hidden anxiety right and so right. she didn't quite realize it at the time but putting me in that class was was really crucial for me because I wasn't the typical I mean you'd, you'd go around this class these were all the kids you would think would be in this kind of class, you know, that right. were sort of like struggling. outwardly, outwardly disturbed. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then I'm Angry, just kind of this, do, this doofy guy sitting there and, you know, kind of like, I don't know, I'm okay. Um, but the truth is that I was, a lot, and I had a lot more in common with those, those kids than I realized. And maybe, maybe my, to be, you know, to be fair to the guidance counselor, maybe she realized that too and just tricked Fun. me to, to go into it. But that's great. if I hadn't had that, I don't think I would have ever thought to, to, fix it with with therapy and so I, I do hope that people embrace it more because that thing of like no nah, way I, I don't want to go and sit and have some some stiff tell me what to do you know that's not what it is at all no, no. plus you know? you're paying them the cash is flowing that way so you're in control ultimately man you do what you want yeah. to do, take what you want to take you know yeah exactly yeah 
That's cool. Difference in between, see, I grew up in the Bronx. We had classes like, you know, how to avoid the next guy who tries to mug you and, you know, how to get home <laughs> yeah. on the train alive. You know, it was a little yeah. different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that is a, a nicer, a nicer environment for sure, man. I'm glad that, yeah. thanks for sharing that, man. That's really cool. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, let's talk about gear and music for a little bit. You are a very solid uh, guitar player, both acoustic and electric. I was wondering, do you prefer playing one over the other? And will you be doing more of one as you do more solo stuff? Um, I think I'll always, I, I always write on acoustic, but I always like electric guitar better. I just, it's just so much fun. I still get a kick every time I like plug in, you know, the cable and hear that little car. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, man. I still love it every time. That's awesome. know, I mean, I could mute my amp and wait, but I, I like hearing it, you know? Yep. Um, so I'm, I'm an electric guy for sure. Yeah. And you, you're yeah. a very warm player, man. Your, your, your leads are like, you always suit the song really well and just very, thank warm. you. Yeah, man. Thank you. Thanks, man. I think, uh, you know, I, my early playing was all playing along to records. Mm. And um, so I was always trying to tuck in to, like I, instead of learning the part of the song, which usually I was just sort of too slow to do, you know, in my early days, I just tried to to do something else. Like as if you know, we added another guitar. Like player. you're another rhythm player, just yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And so you know, I would try to find these sort of you know little pockets to play in, and I think that ended up, you know, in hindsight, it, it has actually affected my style a lot because I tend to sort of. Uh, my favorite bands are the ones that I feel like don't even necessarily need me. <laughs> um, and then I try to do something kind of bonus on top of it, but you like it when something, when it musically works without the guitar. Um, yeah. Whereas some things, you know, I mean like, you know, like cream or something like that, you know, I mean, Gotta have the once guitar. the guitar is out, <laughs> yeah, you know, you kind of need that, that in there. Uh, but I'm a lot more, I like to tuck a lot more and kind of be, you know, part of the, the larger thing. Lindsey Buckingham's a lot like that too. Like he's got his moments, but he's, he's, he's clicked into the song. And if you took him out, the song wouldn't be, you know, uh, as, as good, but it would, everything's like in its place. And then he sort of finds his way around it. Interesting. It's a less dominant approach than a lot of guitar, you know, players have, I think. It's funny you mentioned cream. I read something or I saw something on a buddy's, facebook that there's some cream box set coming out and i oh, always really? like yeah but you know i i have this theory that it's been proven to me the reason why if stuff's not released early on it always seems like there's a reason why yeah and it's never that good i mean why wouldn't they have released it <laughs> right i mean we're saving it for when everybody's almost dead i mean you know that that <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah yeah never yeah, made sense. Not good. i mean with rare exception i've unfortunately not heard a lot of you know stuff that uh no i think that's true well it's, it's like deleted scenes and stuff on you know yeah. dvd you know you watch the deleted scene and you're like i can't even believe that that was in there right you know? i'm so glad you know it's almost like you feel you get ripped off man like i didn't want to see this shit i thought it'd be cool to look at yeah that's exactly yeah 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 Tell me, um, what's your go-to guitar right now, Darren, and what other two might round out your top three? Uh, you know, my go-to right now actually is a is a '68 Jazz Master um, that I got out there in New York. Very and, cool. Yeah, and it was a very random um, purchase. I can't remember the name of that place. It's somewhere down by Bowery Ballroom, but I just okay. saw it. Uh, Rudy's. I think it was Rudy's. Or Chelsea. I think it, might have, about it was Rudy's? all in the same day. It was one of those. Yeah, but I, I think it might have been Rudy's actually. Yeah. And it was just like it had just come in, and they were you know basically still checking it out. And like I think it had been you know maybe gotten that day, and um, and I was so taken with it. And I said, "How much for that thing?" And they said, "How much?" And I I looked it up on eBay and saw a bunch hold, of them hold on a minute and you get out your phone how crazy how wild yeah. is this that the times we're living in now it's like hold on i'm gonna get three fucking proofs of price to make sure you're close <laughs> in the ballpark yeah totally, Reverb, totally yeah. Even, i know it's so cool it's like i feel bad for guys selling shit in stores now it's like how do they make it i know i know i mean if i mean the uh, the other part of it though is that we're it's very rare to get that you know um right. thrift store 
like they didn't realize this is an old Gibson Explorer or something that is actually, you know, worth a lot of money. Right. Very so, it's, much. you know, it cuts both ways. But this, you know, this was pretty cheap because it was beat to hell. I mean, it looks like somebody attacked it with a screwdriver or something. It's like it's so beat up. Um, but uh, I was just so taken with it. I don't know. I was one of the first guitars I played was a, a, a young girlfriend of mine. Her older brother had had one of those. And they're such strange guitars. They have all those switches. and They are. It's like a cockpit man i could never play one of those. <laughs> yeah right that's exactly I'm it just like no, no yeah and i thought like i just it was like because i'm the same i'm a real meat and potatoes i like gibson guitars i don't even like really um fender guitars for the most part i like tallies but i'm not really a fender guy because of the options there's so many different things i get kind of confused i like a real straightforward guitar I but totally once i messed it. with it i was like man this just has a lot of vibe and you know, it was cool. So I picked it up and then, you know, it, it was never a touring guitar because it's just not for that. But lately, it's just, there's so much, you know, a Fender, especially on its own, just sounds so much, sounds so rich and like there's so much tone to it. And um, there's so many things going on, you know, from the, you can just hear the, the single coils and the, the way your pick scrapes kind of is just different. And, um, I've been I've become kind of obsessed with that guitar because there's so many strange things you can with the do. The jazz it. master. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Do you know Nels Klein by any chance? You know who he is? I sure do. Yeah, he, yeah. he's he's unbelievable. He's he he's like uh, you know, I, I I that was the first thing I did was kind of like, oh, I wonder maybe I could pull off some of this like Nels Klein stuff with this guitar, and I still can. Oh, he's <laughs> I had him on the show here. Lovely guy too. There's oh wow, movie, wow, yeah. He, really cool guy. He's had a, a lot of tragedy in his life actually. But um, yeah. there, there's a movie that just came out. I, I, don't, I saw it on the plane coming back home this weekend. It's about uh, the Chelsea, Chelsea guitar. There's a story. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, downtown. In, in, uh, I'm sorry, Carmine Street Guitars. It's a pretty old, famous store. And Rick Kelly's the guy that makes the guitar. And Nels was in there. It was really cool. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, it was just a nice movie about an old-fashioned guitar maker who's, you know, hopefully will be able to stay in business. And, uh, okay, yeah, but, cool. I thought of Nels because he, you know, because you know the jazz master thing. He's un he's unreal. Yeah, he, he really I mean, is. He's a pretty talented guy. Yeah, and it's just so unique. You know, he's he's just oh very like much him. so, very much yeah. so. Man. Okay, so your '68 Jazz Master is number one. What else do you play? Um, you? my '71 ES335, um, is uh, that's the one we talked about earlier, yeah. which was a uh. I, I looked. I was looking on Craigslist, and somebody had this guitar, and it was look, it was listed pretty cheap. And I get there, and it was like a time warp. You know, this guy was like in full on '80s rock, like regalia, <laughs> and uh, you know had big hair and everything. And he's like, "Hey, brother, how you doing?" You know, <laughs> I'm like, "Hey, man!" And yeah. he's got all these guitars around. You know, he's got like BC Rich Warlocks. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> Jacksons and Charvels, and you know all this stuff. And everything's got a Floyd Rose on it and stuff. And, and I'm like amazed, you know, at this house, he's got tons and tons of guitars around. And then, uh, th this, this 335, you know, I, I said, uh, do you know anything about it? He's like, I mean, not really. It's all original. And, um, um, you know, I just know that this thing's been sitting here for six months because nobody wants it. Nobody, nobody wants these old guitars anymore guitars dead you know it's it's over <laughs> and uh, he said like this thing's old-fashioned nobody wants this you know shit like this anymore and uh so yeah, it is know, a piece just, of shit i'll take it <laughs> yeah i mean so i so i lowballed him because i kind of thought like well i mean this guy you know he didn't set himself up very well so right i and i'm not a good negotiator but that was sort of a setup that i i took and uh, okay. he, he led you right into that man. yeah i mean he led me right into it so i, I sort of lowballed him and uh he was like yeah, whatever, man. Just get that thing out of here. Great. Like, oh my sick. God. Good for and you. I was, yeah, it was amazing. And um, so I kind of thought as I was leaving, like, I think I might have just gotten a lemon. Like, how I, I think too good to be true go, kind of thing. Yeah, like something that does, something couldn't be that easy. And sure enough, it's just been my, you know, it's the guitar I've toured with forever and it's my most solid guitar. And I haven't done anything to it really. Wow. Um, and uh, it's just, you know, that's the cherry cool. burst one you have. Yeah. Yeah, it's a pretty yeah, good yeah. Like I said, I've seen it in I some of your videos. I love that. And then um, um, my other probably most, the one I write on the most is actually uh, um, 
uh, J45 that's okay. like pretty new. That's like, you know, from 2010 or something like that. And um, a friend of mine, um, it was a, it was one of the nicest gifts I've ever gotten, but it was right before I went on a um, tour where we were playing with the infamous string dusters. You know, those guys, you ever heard of them? What is their name? They're called the infamous string dusters. Mm, who's in that band? Um, well, Andy Falco is in that band. He's a New York guy, actually, um, who you should talk to. He's a fascinating dude um, and, a, and a real mensch. He's, 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 uh, he's a real sweet, fun guy. But the, the, the infamous string dusters, string dusters, they're all kind of these ringer studio guys who put together a band, I think, maybe eight or ten years ago. And so all of them have had different past, you know, playing, you know, Dobro for Dolly Parton or whatever. You know, they've all had sort of different cool stuff and they wanted to, to do their own thing. And so they've started this bluegrass band. They won a Grammy last year for holy for shit. Man, bluegrass album. Bluegrass people, I've had a number of bluegrass players. They're so they're like very communal oriented. You know, their whole yeah. tribe is like the very strong community, the bluegrass. Yeah, well, those, I mean, those guys have, were so nice to us. I mean, they took us out on tour early on. We had the same booking agent, and uh, you know, bands can you know sometimes get shoved. You know, have some some crappy band that you know gets put on the bill by their booker, and they're like, "Oh, great, who are these assholes?" And they were um, the opposite. They were so welcoming and sweet, cool. and uh, and just great to us. And so, right before we were going on this tour, we were going to do a leg of it uh, acoustic for reasons I don't know because we're a rock band, but someone. Someone in the band decided we should we should tailor it to be acoustic because they play acoustic, but they're of course a bluegrass kick ass band and it was it was a strange call. But um, it's almost weird, like you don't want to play acoustic behind those guys, kind of. Oh, that's what I said. Yeah. <laughs> like as a guitar player, I don't particularly feel like going and playing acoustic next to Andy Falco, who's like a, one of the best acoustic players I've ever heard. So um uh I was nervous beforehand because I, you know, the guitar I had was sort of not that functional and stuff. And, uh, my friend Ashley was my birthday and, um, um, she just said, well, I, you know, I, we were talking about that and, you know, I, I knew you, uh, really needed a, a guitar and I thought, you know, you can, you can take it for a while and maybe I can, you know, take it. I needed to kind of get a guitar anyway. And it was sort of this long dance around it, but she basically said, so I bought this J45 and you can take it on, on tour. tour. Wow, that was so and nice. It was so nice. And then um, I took it, and I, when I came, as soon as I came back, I said, okay, you got to take it back. Now, that was really nice. Yeah. But uh, you got to take it back. And she said, I can't do it now. I, I think it feels, it feels too red. I think you got to keep it. And wow. so, uh, yeah. So, oh, sorry about that. Hello? No, it's all good. Oh, yeah, we'll go. Um, so I, she said, you know, I think you got to, I think you got to keep it. So, very cool. So you gotta, that was a nice yeah. game, man. Yes, it means a lot to me. Yeah. Yeah, very sweet, man. Yeah. Any uh, other interesting stories behind how you acquired any of your guitars? Uh, you know, do you know Brian Farmer? Did you know him at all? He was uh, government mules. Yeah. Warren yeah. You know what? Tech. This is here, man. I've seen this is really cool. I've seen Mule several times, and after he passed, I saw them. And I don't know if you could see this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Warren was, throw, you know, we had pretty good seats. I always go up to my son, either both of them or my older one usually, to concerts. And they, uh, he threw these damn it farmer after he passed. Oh, wow. Picks out. Yeah, so I know who he is. I don't know him personally. I love that. He was amazing. He was hysterical and uh, just a real character. The first, we, we did uh, shows with, um, with Mule and... Uh, I think the first one, I think it was in New Jersey and um, he, he had, you know, I had to plug in after their sound check because we were setting up to be, you know, the opener. And um, God, how do you, uh, that's picking up a guitar after Warren Haynes. That is so, so fucking bad. intimidating, man. It sucks. It sucks. It, I mean, it's, it's just like <laughs> um, no upside to that, man. I give you credit. It doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good <laughs> at all. No. Um, war, war, Derek trucks. We also toured a lot with Tedesco with trucks. TTV, oh my God. And, or, I mean, maybe the scariest day of my life was playing, uh, playing Red Rocks with them. With, and with, Tedesco, with trucks? Tedesco trucks? Oh my God. And, and Gary Clark Jr. 
Oh my God. Yeah, it's Tedeschi. Was, Somebody wrote in, he says, why do you pronounce it? He goes, why do all you Americans pronounce names wrong? I, says, I, I can't speak for all Americans. Sorry, man. I'll... <laughs> Tedeschi, yeah, I know. I let, just, me, let me make yeah, that point. Yeah, Tedeschi. I know, yeah. I just, I, I go with what they say, but yeah. But it was, yeah, it was, you know, so it was Derek Trucks and Gary Clark Jr. and me. And I was like, oh Christ, you know, this is, this is not. That's a tough one, man. This isn't, you can't win. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so with Warren, you know, we were really intimidated, but he, he's also, you know, famously the nicest guy ever. Yeah. And he, he's coming he, on here. I'm just trying to work it out with his people cause he's so busy, but he is oh, coming. cool. Yeah. I can't wait. It, and it was a weird story. And like, I don't even know how this happens, but apparently cause I had by and Satriani on here and they have been telling him, Hey, you gotta go. Cause I think people learn oh, about cool. their buddies yeah. sometimes, you know, they tell yeah, a story. Totally. So uh yeah i don't yeah so i mean i don't know how i got involved in this but i'm very grateful but we're, that's I'm, great like, yeah. i'm looking forward to having him on here yeah. i would love to hear it because yeah i haven't heard that many interviews with him but he's a he's a uh, fascinating dude and uh just an amazing i mean work ethic man that guy's yeah. work ethic oh man. yeah i mean he's just been in it forever it's it's mm. amazing but but uh you know that so you know i was pretty nervous and we were definitely walking around you know on on eggshells not because you know them being mean or anything but we were no. just like we don't belong here you know this is we are amateur yeah it's a big ball and so i was kind of nervous and kind of you know tiptoeing around and trying to figure out where to plug in and um you know i was just looking for my for my quad box or whatever you know at that part of the stage and uh he's like i, I see farmer you know and he's he's like standing right next to the stage at his tech box and he's like you, you need something? And I was like, I'm just not quite sure where to plug in. He's like, we'll just unplug all that shit. And it's like all of Warren's. <laughs> just and, unplug and was, all of Warren's Haynes' gear. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, well, I, uh, I mean, that's okay. I'll just get another, I'll, I'll ask him to, to run out another box. And he's like, you don't need another box. He's like, just, just unplug all that shit. I'll plug it back in. Don't worry about it. And I was like, oh no, I don't want to ask you to, I don't want to ask you to do that. I, I couldn't do that. And uh, he said, god damn it and he like sort of like you know he looked all annoyed and he came over and he just he stood with his feet on the box to hold it down and just yanked <laughs> all the cables out and he's like don't worry i know how to plug them back in oh that's and, funny and man yeah so so i and i was but i was kind of like i couldn't read him i was sort of like is he like was he really annoyed at me or is he is he hysterical you know i couldn't figure out yeah. what had just happened and we go through the whole sound check and everything. And I'm like, I, man, I'm like, and I'm kind of looking over at him and he's kind of like, you know, sort of side eyeing me and I can't figure out what's going on. And then he comes to me like halfway through the sound check while, you know, we're all sort of talking about something. And he just, he comes up to me and he, he starts, he puts his hand on my ass. He starts just patting my ass. <laughs> and, he, and he leans up to my ear and he, <laughs> and he goes, he goes, uh, he's like, you know how to make this, this moment we're having right here, not gay. <laughs> I, said, I said, no. And he said, uh, and he, he, he pat him ass even harder. And then he said out loud, like sort of for, so everyone could hear good game. <laughs> <laughs> and then he just walked away. So I was like, okay, he's definitely funny. And he's okay. Definitely yeah. Around, you know? Yeah. So he was just full of funny little stuff like that. You know, he was nice, he was man. Hysterical. And he was really kind to me. He was the one who, a couple of days later in, in Boston, he came up to me and he said, Hey man, Warren heard you, heard you play. I said, I don't know. I mean, we're here, but I don't, I don't know if he's actually yeah. he's heard me. And he said, okay, I'll make sure he, he hears you. And I, this is cool. You're doing some cool stuff. And I was like, Oh, wow, thanks. You know, wow, and, that that's night, great, man. and that night I look over and he's sitting there with Warren and uh, they watched, you know, a bunch of our set. And then that night Warren asked if we wanted to um, sit in on some stuff. And so I sat in with them and, he sat in with our band and good for you man that yeah is... so that was really all farmer who did that and so this th i was looking for this guitar or i was looking at buying this this 12 string es335 which is a weird guitar because it's, an, it's, it's such it's a, an electric 12 string three es335 yeah and it was a 1966 wow. and it was basically that it all that when all those bands were playing rickenbackers Right. Gibson was like, well, shit, we better do a 12 string. We need something. Yeah. But they put no thought into it. So they just basically used a, a 335 and made it for, for 12 strings, but didn't do really anything else. So 
it's that slim 60s you know neck of a 335 sure <laughs> with 12 strings crammed on it and um it's a very odd guitar and i was looking at this one and it was it was for sale um but it was they said it was painted with like some kind of house paint it was like <laughs> it's not really proper paint and it's chipping and you know there was all these reasons not to get it but it was cheap you know and so i wrote to farmer and just said you know what's your what's your opinion as a yeah that's a guy, guy who would know for yeah sure. like is this a dumb purchase or a smart purchase and he said he said well that's a 66 335 no matter how you slice it so if it doesn't work as a 12 string just use six strings and you got a 66 you know thing and he said that thing's gonna sound like uh, and it you know because it, it was funny because it sort of looked like a piece of shit he said he said i, I bet that thing sounds like white hot lightning wow um, and so um so that's the name of the guitar i called it white hot white lightning, hot which is lightning. funny because it's like a 12 string so it's very gentle and it's, yeah it's you know it's not really the kind of guitar that would have that but um is, but, that, a, uh, is that pafs in there yeah yeah, yeah, wow, yeah. Wow, that's pretty cool. So you can always keep those pick, put those pickups in something else, even if you want. Totally. Yeah. I mean, that was the thing. It was all original, and you know, it was like you know, it's been like it's got this really janky paint job, but even that's charming. You know, I mean, it was, you know, it was blonde before, so it's sort of you know, even when it chips away, it looks cool. You know, that's great. Nice story, man. Very cool. Yeah. Hey, tell me your uh, top three Desert Island discs, just for now um i you know i just i just had a conversation the other day about this this record because i think it's the only record i can safely say is perfect in my estimation where i just i can't think of anything you could change about it that could make it better and it's have you ever heard that self-titled record by willis allen ramsey no it's a it's a strange cut i know it seems kind of like oh you know you're picking some some shit no one's ever heard to be a perfect record come on but no, no, I'm no. telling you, every every time it's all I about how it makes you feel. What kind of people music? Are, is people are always kind of skeptical. It's this kind of like that's part of what makes it great is that it's he was an Austin guy, and it's very Austin in the sense of it combines a whole lot of different things. So it's it's a it's you know got a little bit of a country vibe. It's kind of like the band. It's sort yeah. of it's a it's a mixture of stuff like that, you know. And particularly these days, it would just be sort of like a great Americana record, I guess, is sort of what you would think of it now. Um, but it's, he wrote the song uh, Muskrat Candlelight, which became Muskrat Love. Oh, my God. And, but it's funny because you hear For Captain two, and Tennille? Yeah, but you hear these two different versions. And the Captain and Tennille one makes you just want to pull your hair out. Yes. And, he, yes. you know, and then his version will make you cry. It's the most beautiful thing ever and it's got this groove to it and it's just everything about this record just cooks and moves leon russell plays on it and lee sklar and all these great players it's funny and it was man. on it was on leon's shelter records but i would say that one for sure willis, willis allen, allen ramsey so it's just called willis allen ramsey probably yeah and a guy yeah. made one record he's still alive he's still out there but he made one record ever That's funny and he continues, you know, promising a follow-up is just around the corner. But it just came out around in 1972. The corner. Wow. Yeah. What would be number two and three? It's funny, I saw Lee Sklar at NAMM. And man, oh, what really? a gracious guy. He's coming on the show next month, but what a gracious guy. He, everybody was just lined up and he was like, oh, to take photos. Like, oh yeah, sure, sure. You know. Oh, wow. That's cool. Yeah, you know, if you, I mean, yeah. not to, I don't want to make your interview about my personal agenda, but no, no, I would, there's so little known about this Willis Allen Ramsey record and what it, Dude, what it what? was. I'm going to ask him that. Yeah, I would, I, mean, I think it would probably be fascinating because. Well, if nothing else, he'll be like, how the hell did you know that? Yeah. Like, I'll get some creds, man. I'll get some street yeah, creds. Yeah, totally. Willie, and it's, it's Willis one Allen. of those records that it's got a small following, but the people that know it just absolutely love it. Um, it's one of Greg's favorite records. I think Greg, that you know, that is actually what it was. Greg Loicano. Greg we turned were, you on to that? Yeah, we were, uh, we were sitting backstage one night at one of their shows, one of the Mother Hip shows. And um, he was sitting there with Jackie Green. Do you know Jackie? Yeah, I just got introduced to him recently, yeah. Okay, yeah. And the two of them were playing Muskrat Candlelight. And I was kind of chuckling at first because I was like, they're playing Captain and Tail, what the hell? But then it was really moving and, and emotional. And, we, and everyone kind of in the, in the backstage area was like, Jesus Christ, that was 
great. And I said to Greg after, like, man, you're a great singer because that's a that's a song I don't really like, but now it seems like one of my favorite songs ever. And he said, oh, you got to hear the original. He said, this record is unreal. And I ended up picking up the record on vinyl like next week. I, I saw it and I was like, oh, perfect. And uh, it totally blew my mind. And it is still, you know, these seven or eight years later, I mean, it, I, I listen to it every couple of weeks and it just totally blows me out. Well, I'm definitely going to check it out. Willis Allen Ramsey out of Austin. Yeah. Number yeah. two. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's a newer record, but I find that it's become an essential one for me is Nicole Atkins, um, who's a Jersey girl, actually. Um, she put out a record called Goodnight Rhonda Lee, maybe three, four years ago. And Rhonda Lee was her drinking name. <laughs> and, uh, so oh, it's kind wow. of her, it's kind of her putting her, her she got past. sober. Yeah. That's pretty slick. It's pretty yeah. amazing. And, um, it's pretty slick, man. It's a beautiful record that I just feel like it can't, you know, really great records to me come out of a, a urgent need at that moment of like, they, they have something so clear that they have to get to and get out. And, um, that record is just something that every line of it connects with me. And I, I feel like there's just something really special about it that I, I can't imagine how, you know, it's, it's amazing to think something that that recent would be on a desert Island list. But if I was leaving tomorrow, it would, I, I'd have to grab it. It's Nicole it's good. Adkins. Good night, Rhonda Lee. Great concept, yeah. man. I like that. Yeah. It's so good. I mean, she, there's a song that she co-wrote with Chris, Chris Isaac called a little crazy. That's just like a, it's just one of the best songs I've ever heard. <laughs> I mean, you just, and, it, and her voice is incredible. And um, there's just nothing about it that isn't, doesn't blow my mind. Very cool, man. Yeah. Definitely check it and out. And then let's see a third. Um, I think, uh, I think to, to, to pivot. <laughs> You're going to have um, like yeah, Sonic I'm, Youth or something from your punk roots, man. I'm sure. Well, I, no, I think Appetite for Destruction. There you go. It had to be something a little raucous, man. A little raucous because that that album reset guitar for me, which was I, you know, I I love I love Van Halen. I loved Van Halen growing up and stuff. I loved a lot of that, you know, music and you know metal and the the hair rock and stuff of the eighties. But um, the guitar did not interest me. Like the tapping and yeah, the dive I was, bombs. I was never like yeah i agree with you i like something soulful man yeah i just didn't get it and so slash was like you know he popped into this scene where everybody's playing you know like you know motley crew or something and um just slowed it down and just made it about cool guitar and like standing cool and great you know blues guitar player man He's yeah amazing yeah so that player. record like you know i was eight i think when that record came out and it really shifted my brain a lot probably in ways that my parents <laughs> <laughs> we're not thrilled about but that was a that set me on a course for sure great record man yeah yeah and it's still it still here. just kicks ass i mean it's incredible how you put that record on and you hear you know the beginning the, of welcome to the jungle right the very first like, God, like it's just it just rules all the way through you know really good record man yeah Thanks. i'm gonna check out these other two nicole atkins and willis allen ramsey yeah and i will uh make a note to send you the sklar interview if we cover it All righty. Uh, tough question. What do you like most about yourself? Um, you know, I think it's, uh, it's just something I learned the hard way. Um, but, you know, in, in when the chips are down and, you know, some people are gonna be okay and some people aren't there are people who either sort of kind of go well we're just gonna figure this out together and we're gonna go down together and you know whatever but like you know they don't have that instinct to, to take care of themselves and there are some people who are very good at taking care of themselves go you know fuck the group i i want to make sure that i'm i'm okay at the end of this and i think probably if you'd asked me i would have said i was probably in that group in the latter group i would have probably said i was you know like I, I think i'll look out for me you know number one and and you know it's it, my attitude in life is is sort of um 
you know, because I am a little, a little anxious and a little whatever, I tend to be a little protective of myself and all that stuff. So I would have thought I was kind of one of those people and going on the road and being put in a lot of different situations um, from, you know, little things of just, you know, your, your actual safety in the van or, you know, the, the dynamics of a band or whatever, um, you know, you're really tested and you find out which one of those kind of people you are. If you sort of care more about the group that you're with and, and want to, um, you know, nurture that and make sure everyone's okay. Or if you isolate more and want to take care of yourself and, you know, it's, you know, it's always hard to find things about yourself that you like, but I was sort of pleasantly surprised to find out that I tended to, I wasn't happy when it was just me making it out of a situation. I, you know, I, I, I really want everybody to be okay. So you um, look out and, for the greater good. Yeah. And I think that, you know, that's a, I, I, I embrace that now that I'm a little bit more aware of it and I'm, I'm happy for that because those are the people that have gotten me through countless <laughs> endless stumbles are the people that have kind of looked at me and kind of gone, okay, you're the weakest one in the, in the pack right now. But we're, <laughs> we got you. We're going to circle around. We're going to pull you out of the mud bog or whatever and, you know, get you back onto land and make sure you're okay. And I'm so grateful for those people. So I'm glad that, you know, when, when it's really come down to it and I've been tested that I, I didn't, you know, go the other way. That's cool, man. Very nice. Yeah. yeah. Tell me something about yourself people might be surprised to hear or might find a little odd. Um, well, I think people would probably be surprised that I'm, uh, you know, it's some of the things that we've talked about today. I think they'd probably be a little surprised that I'm anxious or that I, mm. um, you know, feel, uh, you know, uncomfortable um, in, in crowds and sort of talking to, you know, to people and, you know, social interaction and stuff, because it's, because I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sort of practiced at it and have, have man, you know, for somebody who, who, you know, for, for a living goes and stands on a stage and asks everyone in the room to clap for them, <laughs> you know, that's pretty would, common. There's a lot more yeah. common than you think, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You, um, yeah. But so I'm, I'm pretty, um, I feel genuinely kind of embarrassed by attention and, and don't really, you know, I, Music, I, I wish so bad. Like my my ideal concert, and I've seen people. Do you know Steve Poltz? Poltz, he's a singer no. songwriter. No. He co-wrote uh, the Jewel song "You Were Meant for Me," but he's also had a he's had a unbelievable career. You should talk to him actually because he's a great Poltz. guitar player, <laughs> and he's he's a fascinating. I mean, he's one of the great rock and tours of all time. He's just he can tell a story like no one else. And Rack on tours. You know, I don't hear that word that often. This may be the second time I've heard that word in 650. <laughs> yeah, it's a great. I mean, it's very. It's very rare you meet a rack on tour. You know. Yeah, it's and an it's SAT easy. word, I think. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> but you know, it's pretty rare to to meet somebody that you really would say that about. And he's one of those people that can just. He's just got a billion stories. He's so entertaining, and he's he's amazing. Um, and um, and he's he's got a big you know following and. The, these at his shows he started doing he started playing uh wirelessly mm. and he goes out into the crowd and wanders around and you know kind of intermingles and that's how i i wish so bad that concerts were less about focusing everything on everybody standing in one side of the room and we're just about the communal sort of experience of it because the least appealing part of playing a show is just that everybody's looking at you and Right. And, and all the focus is on you and stuff. And, and I just, I've never felt comfortable with that in my, in my life. So it's funny that I would choose this, this career <laughs> to be a, to be an artist on stage. Yeah. 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 That's common though. Like I said, a lot of, a lot of players and artists I've spoken to they they, they are, they all, they do suffer from anxiety and, and uh, it's almost like a, uh, a test every day for them. You know, I'm going to, yeah this is going to be an experiment and see what happens sort of thing. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, for sure. It's, I think it's probably a way to get out too. I mean, the, the uh, first time I remember playing on stage in front of a crowd, I was so scared. And then once I did it, everyone was cool and supportive and nice. And they were cooler to me for weeks after that at school and everything. And I, it definitely connected in my brain of like, okay, if you do this music thing, people are actually pretty nice to you. And, 
you know, I think it, that came out of this, out of social anxiety, you know, whereas if right. you were already a popular, cool, you know, kid who fit in, I don't think that would seem as appealing, you know, because you'd already have it, you know? Yeah. I do. You, know? you know, it's funny. I was at NAM this weekend, as I mentioned, and my buddy was playing in one of the booths there. I've only been playing guitar like four years and I've never played in front of anybody. He's Craig, make your public appearance, your first public appearance and your grand debut at Nam right now. Take my guitar and play it. I'm like, no fucking way. He goes, take the guitar and play it. I'm like, <laughs> he goes, I'll play blues and a minor. I'm like, okay, <laughs> I can handle that. And, he had a, and I was playing and man, you know what? He took some pictures of me playing and just looking at the pictures was like, man, I've got to get out and do this more because I was having such a good, it had nothing to do playing in front of people, it had to do playing yeah. with yeah. some, you know, it wasn't in front of, it was that I was with, and I, and I was so glad he did that because it was the best playing experience in my short playing experience life. Yeah, no, yeah. It was so, so happy he did that because now I'm going to make sure I have to get together with somebody and play, you know, it was really yeah. hard. Yeah, it's, it's so huge. I mean, it's, it's a magic thing to just play you know blues and a minor i mean like that's it's it's it always was fun. Me, it was like holy yeah. shit man i was like yeah. this feels so good and yeah, i wasn't no, thinking about how i play how well i play how well i don't play i was just doing yeah. what i can and having a good time and he said that's yeah. what you need to do don't think so much yeah i i mean i can't stay i mean I, I i find sometimes in my playing i i, I sometimes I, I'll, I'll paint myself into a corner and I'll know that all the guitar players in the room will want me to find a fancy way out. And so I will just take <laughs> the most, I'll take the most blunt, um, you know, violent way out of a corner by just, you know, hit, hitting a big sprong or something. Yeah. Cause I sort of like, I just feel like anyone who's, who gives that much of a shit about judging your playing has already missed the point. You know, if you, if you play with energy and spirit and you and dig passion it, passion, I mean, nothing is better. I mean, yeah. you know, yeah, there was a totally. kid, uh, this, th I was playing at, um, at a, a, a showroom thing, a guitar thing here for Homestead Amps, which is, a, sure. a, yeah, I know, you know they're amazing. And the, uh, the, they, I, I, one of their players, and so I was, you know, showing up doing this sort of, um, uh, you know, playing thing of, you know, I would jam with people who were coming by and it's this like kid comes up, this little kid and, um, he's got a guitar and he asked if he can plug in and i'm like yeah sure you know and i'm like this is adorable what's this what's this little guy gonna play mary had a little lamb you know and um he he asked me i can't remember i think it was little wing but he said like do you know little wing and i was like yeah sure so i started playing you know the chords to little wing and he kind of like waited a second and then he came in and it was beautiful you know it was like you know he's young but i mean he was like he was totally going for it and feeling it and I, all, and all these memories came back to, of me playing little wing you know it was a big you know one to sure. practice solo on and yeah yeah um we ended up jamming back and forth um for you know 20 minutes um going Very doing cool. all these different things and this kid was amazing and um i thought god i swear to god this kid's like he's tapped into something really cool two years later that kid he's a gibson artist now and he's like his name's Taz? asher no, oh. he but he's he's friends with Taz. His name's Asher Belsky. That's so funny. And he's phenomenal. He's like he's amazing. He sings great. He plays great. And um, you know, he's he's it's that's what guitar is about. It's just yeah. like you know, being being that kid who just says like fuck it, I want to play a little wing, and like let's do it. And fuck when you it, have I that attitude and when you charge forward and just say like, I'm going to make this happen. Then, you know, sure enough, this kid, a couple of years later, he's really already doing it for himself. He's like 14 years old. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Hey, you have any hobbies outside of music, Darren? And filmmaking? I mean, hardly because now they're sort of, uh, the ones that were hobbies were like, you know, big, big film lover. And I've shot short films and, done stuff like that but now that's kind of blended into the to music thing where i've sort of realized that any time i have for hobbies if i sort of blend that with music that i can um i can you know it's the, by blurring that line you can use your hobby time to actually make your career thing better so 
it's I don't really have a sort of like I go and play squash on the weekends. <laughs> you know, kind of, kind of quite I'm sure you're those. gonna say squash, man. I, I seem like a squash guy, but, but believe it or not, yeah, not really. Two more questions, man. Toughest decision you've had to make, or most difficult thing you've had to do? Um, I think uh, I think the toughest decision that I ever made. And this is, you know, slightly off what we're talking about. But I think also important because a lot of people that I know are still go through this is to get uh, to get out of a long term relationship that wasn't that, healthy, that wasn't working. Yeah. And it was with a good person. And, you know, it was there were a lot of things about it that you would sort of think maybe this is salvageable or whatever. But I think being able to make that decision of just like we're, we're doing more work to stay together than we are to to make this great um, that's when you know the, the 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 scales of tip when the pain of doing it is greater than the pain of not doing it yeah yeah when you're you just know. you know it's it's important and you know it's a fine line because you you know for me you know i was always i i, I never wanted to be one of those people who you know quit something and, and who walked away when it got hard and stuff but the but the other side of that is that a lot of people just end up staying in something that is not working for them oh, and totally. you know and one uh, and the end of that relationship which was for nine years um oh wow that's a long one that had that was that's a tough one man to walk away it was a lot yeah i mean it was basically you know almost like a, a marriage and um um uh, but the end of that for you. signaled the change of so many great things for both of us because we yeah. were both in something that wasn't working for either of us so um you know, I would say that that's the hardest thing to do, but also the most rewarding is to to really know where your energy is spent well um, in your personal relationships with people, and to be able to sometimes say, "This is not the best use of this energy," because yeah. it good can really you. change your life when you start focusing it in the right way. You know. Oh God, yeah, that's good, yeah. man. Good for you, man. Yeah. Congratulations Thank on you. that one. Hey, and uh, last question, and, and thank you so much for everything, man. I really appreciate your time. It's been really cool to talk with, and thanks for being so open and for sharing. Yeah, thank you, man. This is great. Cool. Biggest yeah. change in your personality over the last 10 years, and how much of that has been intentional, and how much is just a natural part of aging? You're not that old, so go seven to 10 years if you want. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would say uh, um, I'm – I'm both, I'm, I'm more trusting, but I, but it's because I'm more selective about who I'm trusting to, if that makes sense. So gotcha, I used to yeah. sort of, I used to just be sort of wide open, kind of like, I'm just going to trust everybody and hope that the odds land in my favor. And I tended to be somebody who kind of could get to take advantage of because of that. Yeah. And now that I'm old, you know, once you're, you've been around the block a little bit, you start to be able to see patterns and see kind of like, okay, there's, there's situations that are worth spending that on and there's situations that you got to just kind of duck out of kind of like what we were just saying, but musically yeah. too and all that kind of stuff. And so, um, I'm, I'm, I'm more selective about that stuff. Yeah. You I'm get also, to see the signals quicker. Yeah. But I'm also way more open than with the relationships that I do have. And you know, the, the musicians I play with and everything, it's like, it's such a wide open free thing you know like like i've been you know recruiting some some really great musicians to play on my um singles and you know like with like tim lefave and peter levin and i, I just got michael holger who's from uh, margo price's band and awesome. i met him when he's playing with emmy lou and these really great players and um i i used to be you know i would either be intimidated by people like that or be um you know worried about how they'd perceive me or how they perceive a song or something like that. Um, and, um, you know, now I try to really just sort of trust that like, okay, you know, um, that hopefully they'll like it. Hopefully they'll dig it. And if they don't, you know, they'll, they'll be honest with me and just sort of be able to say like, okay, it's going to be fine. And when I do give them the, the songs, I don't give much direction. Um, and I don't, um, I don't want to push what they're, doing too much whereas i would probably wouldn't have i probably wouldn't have trusted either myself or them 
back in the day would have all been nervous and been a lot of thinking and a lot of discussion and a lot of, you know, what's the right thing to do and did they do it? And, and now it's just way more free flowing and, and just sort of like let people do what they do and trust that it's right. And, um, you know, don't be, don't be so controlling um, and worried about the final product and having some vision in your head, but let the, let the process, you know, go forward and, and let, let what, let it be, man, you know, <laughs> just let it be, let it be. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, you have no reason for whatever it's worth. I mean, you're a very competent player acoustically, electrically, and you're an excellent songwriter, man. All your stuff yeah, is thank works. You. Yeah, man. So I like as an outsider and we are all our own worst critic for sure, man. But yeah, I, yeah. yeah, you know, you're like, when it comes to songwriting, especially man, someone coming in on your thing, they're going to, they're going to find a groove on that for sure. Man. Yeah. So, thanks, man. Thank you're you. You're welcome. Appreciate yeah. Hey, listen, let me tell people where to find you and what you got going on. So first of all, it's Darren Nay, D-E-R-E-N-N-E-Y. Check out Darren's last single, West Coast Mama. Really good song. Check out the video. Also, uh, check out the video he made for Greg Loyacano, L-O-I-A-C-O-N-O, -O -O, called Chamberlain's Trunk. Darren made that video. It is fucking amazing. Um, I was shocked that one dude made that to me. It looked, I said to him, Hey man, that's how I got hooked up with you. I said, dude, where did you get that video made, man? I, I'm, <laughs> I'm like, God, I'm thinking shit. This guy's got not that you're inexpensive. I'm like, I figured this is a massive budget thing. And yeah. Like, Darren name made it. I'm like, who's that? And he says, a musician, but I said, man, I'd love to talk with that guy. Cause that's, that's amazing stuff. That's yeah. So oh, thank you. Thanks, yeah, man. that's 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 exactly why we hear your video. Uh, so yeah, check it out. It's sure. called Chamberlain's Trunk. Uh, Darren made it. If you are a musician or a band and you want to connect with Darren uh, to talk about production or to talk about having him help you make your next video, uh, hit him up on his website. It's Darren Nay, D-E-R-E-N-N-E-Y dot com. And he's got a contact tab there. Just give him some info about it. Don't just say, hey, man, I think you should make my video. <laughs> Give a little context. A little song. Uh, your uh, Darren's next song is coming out real soon, around the time that this uh, show should drop. It's called Cr Crown Shyness. Did I mess it up? Crown Shyness, yeah. Crown Shyness, yeah. And the uh, Crown Shyness, and the vibe of that is stay home and get high. So you can get that's his get his next T-shirt. Get get on his T-shirt subscription. Yeah, 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 right, yeah. Crown Shyness, it's the new single. It's an animated video, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, that's it, man. Merch at DarrenA.com. Anything else I forget? Anything else that you're doing? No, that's great, man. That's awesome. Thank you so a little much. little side fortune telling on the side, maybe? I do a little bit of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the the Some cards light don't work. lie. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, man, thank you very much for everything. I really appreciate it. It was really nice yeah, talking bro. with you. And uh, thank you, much success with everything you're doing. You're a super talented guy, and I'm glad we got to connect. So, thank uh, you, bro. I appreciate it. Up. Oh, man. Thank you. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, please share it on your social media channels. We appreciate your support. Check out Darren's music, darrennay.com. Check out his videos, what he's got going on, Chamberlain's Trunk, West Coast Mama. Crown Shyness is the new one that's coming out right around the time here. Uh, you're on social media where you wanted people to follow yep, you? Yeah, just at, at Darren Day, D E R E N N E Y. There you go, at Darren A on all the socials. Hit him up. Tell him you enjoyed the interview. And uh, most important, remember that happiness is a choice, so choose wisely. Be nice, go play your guitar, and have fun. Until next time, peace and love, everybody. I'm out. Darren, thanks for everything, brother. Thanks, man. Appreciate it.